Hello wonderful person, this is Anton, and today we're going to be talking about the center of our own galaxy once again, and potentially a very intriguing and somewhat anomalous discovery from one of the recent studies. But without giving you too many spoilers right away, the assumption here is that what if it's not actually a black hole in the middle? What if it's something entirely different? And the paper itself is very intriguing in that it presents a really strong argument. But anyway, let's take baby steps. First of all, I wanted to start with this iconic video right here. This right here is the result of years and years of work that then culminated in the incredible award in physics, the Nobel Prize in Physics, in 2020. This was the confirmation that there was a really massive black hole in the center of our own galaxy. And this short video shows you approximately 20 years of orbits of various stars in the vicinity. Now, the most famous of these stars, and the one that's been studied the most, is the star known as S2. There are actually quite a lot of these so-called S stars in the orbit of the um, central black hole, which in case you didn't know is known as Sagittarius A star and it's visible right there in the center. But S2 is particularly important because a few years ago, just like approximately 100 years ago, it allowed the scientists to prove something really important. It allowed the scientists to finally confirm a lot of Einstein's ideas and a lot of Einstein's theories. And ironically, just like when Einstein proved his theory of relativity by using the precession of the orbit of Mercury just over a hundred years ago, by observing the orbit of the S2 stars at the closest point to the black hole, the scientists were able to confirm various effects that are expected from such a massive object, such as, for example, the redshifting effect of the light itself. Which, of course, once again confirmed that there is a really massive black hole in the center of the galaxy. But then something else was discovered in this region, something that still doesn't really have a very good explanation. The objects that are currently referred to as the G objects. The objects that might look something like this. Although this is just the artist's impression right now, and even today it's still not entirely clear what exactly these objects are. In a nutshell though, these also seem to be stars, but stars that approach the black hole close enough for them to start to kind of fall apart and to get disrupted quite a lot, just to then rebuild themselves as they move away from the black hole. So they're sort of like stars, but not really, they're more like gas clouds. And although the original discovery itself already created quite a lot of mysteries about these objects, with potentially a completely new class of objects nobody's ever seen before, what became even more interesting is observing their orbits. And specifically about a year ago, with this particular paper right here, argued that something else could potentially explain what we're observing with the orbits of these objects. It was actually almost as if these objects were experiencing a bit of a drag from the vicinity of the black hole. Now, one potential explanation I've discussed in one of the previous videos was that, well, maybe it's that the region around the black hole, actually a very large region around the black hole, contains almost like an exosphere or a somewhat thin atmosphere. And maybe this is what's creating this unusual drag and is forcing these objects to behave in strange ways. But this wasn't a very widely accepted explanation and more importantly, it didn't explain everything. A lot of things still didn't make sense. This unusual drag force that was detected from the orbit of the G2 object was still very mysterious and very, very difficult to understand. But that's at least until now. Now there's this new paper, and the explanation here is very, very intriguing. The explanation here replaces a very compact and really massive black hole with a somewhat less compact, but also really massive, some kind of a dark matter core halo or essentially a really, really large chunk of dark matter all in the same spot. And though it might sound really strange, this particular idea has actually been sort of proposed before to explain how some supermassive black hole can essentially form so massive so quick. By having a really large chunk of dark matter present there in the beginning, a lot of matter can accumulate around it and then form a black hole of some sorts. But in this particular case, the scientists are really arguing that if we were to completely replace the compact black hole in the center with a much more widespread and much less compact uh, dark matter core-like formation that's made out of these hypothetical particles they refer to as darkinos, suddenly all of the observations of orbital parameters make a lot more sense. It obviously explains the orbits of S stars, but it also explains the orbits of G stars and the unusual observations of this drag that we see as well. Now, just like with a lot of other unusual propositions, this is just an idea for now. It's just a hypothesis. 
it still requires a lot of proof and chances are it might be actually proven incorrect at some point. But at the moment this is a really intriguing proposition because, well first of all, it sort of solves the problem of not being able to detect dark matter. Especially because in this paper the scientists even propose a very specific particle that could explain what we're seeing. At the same time, it sort of solves the problem with the unusual orbital observations of G objects, something that is still not really well explained. And in this case it's essentially stars just moving through a kind of a halo of dark matter and being disrupted by these particles as it passes through the dark matter. And in this case, because there is such a high concentration of it in this region, this is why the stars sort of fall apart, but then they don't really get destroyed, they kind of rebuild themselves once they move far enough away. And lastly, all of these observations still kind of make sense. If it's just a chunk of dark matter as opposed to, well I guess, a black hole, we would not really observe anything differently. While at the same time it might also explain why our black hole is not particularly active. However, it would be a lot more difficult to explain why we're seeing certain flares from this region and why we're still seeing a lot of X-ray radiation and a lot of other radiation. So obviously there are still going to be a lot of mysteries. But this is a really big assumption right now and naturally nobody really knows exactly what's happening there, especially because our telescopes are just not good enough to observe this region. So for example the Event Horizon Telescope that took the beautiful image of M87 black hole has not really been that successful with our own black hole. Things just happen so much more quickly there that it's very difficult to capture a very good image. But assuming that these scientists are correct, so what exactly is happening with the object itself, in the one in the middle? So it's not really a black hole yet, but it might turn into one, specifically a supermassive black hole, if approximately 100 times more mass is sort of introduced into it. So in other words, if the object in the middle of the galaxy becomes roughly around 50 million masses of the sun of this Darkino material, it might turn into an actual legit black hole, with the object itself in the center maybe resembling some sort of a halo-like formation like you see right here, although possibly not in this color or possibly even completely invisible. But it would definitely form some sort of a dense object in the middle, with a slightly more diffuse area around it which forms the drag that was observed in the G2 object. Which theoretically at least could then also expand to the outer reaches of the galaxy, forming even larger halo-like formations around most galaxies. And when they applied their calculations to 17 known objects with 17 known orbital parameters, mathematically at least their explanation made a lot of sense. The orbit of every one of these objects, these S stars in this region, could be perfectly explained using this particular idea. And although this idea might sound a little bit strange, it also provides quite a lot of different answers to many mysteries. The mysteries of very massive black holes in the early universe, obviously the mystery of various dark matter observations around the universe, but also more importantly explains how certain black holes can grow so massive so quick. By having these seeds of dark matter that accumulates really quickly, it would be much easier for a typical black hole to form around it. So obviously it doesn't change the fact that black holes are out there and that they exist, it just changes the fact about what's in the middle of our own galaxy. But I guess for now at least, it's just an interesting hypothesis. It does not have a lot of observational proof just yet, obviously nobody has ever seen these Darkinos and they've never been detected anywhere, and even though the scientists propose a specific mass for them, we still need to actually find them. If one day this particle is discovered somewhere on Earth by one of the dark matter experiments, then this changes everything. But for now, the only thing that this paper does really well is explain the unusual parameters of G objects. But the thing is, they've only been discovered a few years ago and they're still new and not very well understood. There could be a lot of other explanations to what we're observing and some of the future explanations might not necessarily change the central black hole into a completely new object. So at least in my opinion, this is maybe not the best explanation just yet. A lot of follow-ups are needed before anything can be said with certainty. Nevertheless, it's still an intriguing proposition and a somewhat intriguing paper. It still doesn't change the fact that there is something massive in the center of our galaxy, it just changes the fact of what we think it is. I mean, maybe the scientists in this paper are right. Maybe it's not actually a black hole, but instead is a chunk of this unusual mysterious dark matter. At least one type of dark matter that's believed to exist in the universe. But it will probably be a few more studies before we can really say anything with certainty. At the moment I'm actually more curious 
to see more studies about these objects, what exactly is happening to them when they approach this object in the middle, and more importantly it'd be interesting to see what they really look like, at least by using some sort of a supercomputer simulation. But for now that's pretty much it. Intriguing paper, very interesting proposition, but no conclusive results just yet. And so make sure to subscribe if you'd like to find out how this story ends and what we discover in the middle of our own galaxy in some of the future studies. Hello wonderful person, this is Anton, and today we're going to be discussing one of the biggest mysteries of the universe. Where is all of the antimatter? Where are all the anti-stars, anti-galaxies, and so on? And specifically we're going to be discussing this recent study that might have identified several candidates for what we would call an anti-star. But let's start with baby steps. Let's talk about antimatter in general, and let's also talk about the idea that antimatter should technically be everywhere. So for example, in pretty much all of the modern theories of physics, it's assumed that in the beginning of the universe, a completely equal amount of matter and antimatter was produced initially. So basically for every single one electron there should be one positron, and for every single proton there should be one antiproton. And so it's always been assumed that there should be some sort of a symmetry in the production of matter and antimatter. But from all of the observations of the universe around us, from most of the stars we've seen, from pretty much most of the galaxies, it does seem like there is some sort of an imbalance or actually complete misbalance. There's a lot of matter everywhere, but we don't really see any antimatter. So for example, we're not really seeing any antimatter galaxies or antimatter stars. We're also not really seeing any other antimatter particles coming toward planet Earth. Although here we have to be really careful. Even though you can hypothetically have any kind of an antiparticle, like this is an example of antiproton, which by itself is made out of antiquarks, in reality, the only difference between this and regular proton is basically charge. So in case of a positron, it's a positive charge, in case of an electron, it's a negative charge. And if an antiproton and a proton collide, they annihilate each other, creating a lot of energy, while occasionally also leading to the creation of various other subatomic particles as well. Oh, and a quick fun fact before I continue. Today we consider antimatter to be the most expensive material on the planet. To produce one single gram, it would cost approximately 25 billion US dollars. So even today NASA and a lot of other scientists have been trying to figure out if there is an easy way for us to produce a lot of this material on the cheap by possibly using some natural sources. Some scientists have even suggested that since a lot of antimatter is produced on the planet in for example lightning as you can see in this image, we could maybe somehow capture that. Alternatively. We could also try to produce antimatter by using extremely fast particles and a lot of extremely fast accelerator-like conditions around the planet in various highly energetic conditions around Earth such as the Van Allen's belts or some other locations where there's a lot of particle and antiparticle creation going on at all times. But except for this natural generation of antiparticles in the lightning or in for example highly energetic conditions in the magnetic lines of the planet, or obviously in the artificial particle accelerators on the planet such as the Large Hadron Collider, we don't really know of any other presence of antimatter anywhere around our planet. We also don't really know why the universe seems to be dominated mostly by matter and the antimatter seems to be completely absent. Now one explanation of course is that maybe some of these stars and galaxies are antimatter but because they kind of look similar to regular matter we just don't really know if it is antimatter because no regular matter is there to collide with it to produce obvious observations of sudden release of energy. But that's a really big assumption because if a galaxy is entirely made of antimatter and it collides with another galaxy made of just matter, that is going to be quite a big explosion that is probably going to be noticeable from everywhere in the universe. And we haven't seen anything like this happening anywhere. Some other hypothetical explanations involve the idea of the universe splitting into two, with matter universe following our timeline, whereas with the antimatter universe following the opposite timeline. Or basically, maybe there is a universe somewhere out there that goes in a completely different time direction that's essentially made of just antimatter. And in that universe, there is another anti Anton talking on anti YouTube about the possible matter universe where we live. So in that sense, I mean, it kind of makes sense, but there's absolutely no proof to this and there's basically no way for us to know any of this other than of course just hypothesizing about it because 
we're not going to be able to prove this. And there are so many other explanations, including the one I covered a few months ago, with some potential discoveries suggesting that the universe has a preference for one side. And this could explain why more matter was produced originally, initially annihilating all of the antimatter that might have been present in the universe in the beginning. Now, those explanations still need a lot more proof as well, and there's just not enough evidence for any of this yet. But nevertheless, we should still kind of see some antimatter somewhere out there. Now, a study published a few months ago hypothetically imagined what would happen if there was an entire cluster somewhere on the outskirts of the galaxy made out of antistars. They essentially imagined what would happen and theoretically tried to predict what would we actually see. What type of particles, specifically here they focused on anti-helium, would be detectable from planet Earth? And what sort of energies would we see by looking at this type of an object? But a global cluster would contain thousands if not millions of antistars. That's a big assumption. Also, a collision with such an object would produce a lot of energy. So maybe anti-cluster is going a little bit too far. But how about a single star? A single anti-star? Now that is not a far-fetched assumption. Having a star that has never collided with anything is actually quite possible. I actually made a video a long time ago um, explaining the chances for a star collision when, for example, two galaxies collide. So today we know that, for example, when the Milky Way and Andromeda galaxies collide in a few billion years from now, not a single star will most likely collide. None of them will even pass close enough to interact with one another. There will be some interaction, but it's going to be really, really minuscule. And that's actually because of the volumes involved here. A single star takes up a tiny volume in comparison to the entire galaxy. So you could hypothetically, in a single galaxy, have at least one antimatter star that would never interact with pretty much anything. And when it does interact with something, it might produce some energy, but that interaction might not be enough to destroy the star and might actually be very rare. And since in the past the scientists have actually detected antimatter coming from regions of outer space, there's something going on there for sure. But can we find, can we identify anti-stars if they exist? And well, that's pretty much what the scientists behind this paper decided to do. They decided to figure out if we can use the gamma ray observations from the Fermi telescope to look at specific types of gamma ray light that's produced when antimatter and matter annihilates and then try to identify locations in the galaxy where this type of light, gamma ray light, might be emitted from. Now, as I mentioned before, a typical anti-star would not really, we think, look different from a typical star. It would do its own anti-star stuff, it would have its own uh, fusion reaction, it would also produce its own energy, but it would only be possible to tell it apart if it was emitting certain types of gamma ray emissions when matter collided with it and when it emitted a certain type of frequency. Very similar to the emissions we observe here on planet Earth when, for example, various types of matter and antimatter annihilate in the upper atmosphere. And so in this paper, the scientists looked at approximately 6,000 different gamma ray points of light from various locations in the galaxy, all of them analyzed over approximately 10 years of Fermi telescope observations, and to everyone's surprise, identified 14 points of light that actually did give out the gamma rays where the energy levels were usually common to antimatter annihilation. And more specifically, none of these points looked like typical gamma ray sources. They didn't look like your typical neutron star, such as a pulsar. They also didn't look like what we expect from black holes and really any other gamma ray source that is familiar to us. With the major assumption so far being that, well, maybe, just maybe, what we are looking at are these 14 possible antimatter stars. And once again, it's a really, really big maybe that will be investigated and investigated for many years to come. But nevertheless, the implication is still there. There's a slight chance, very small chance, that what they discovered are possibly antimatter stars in the middle of our own galaxy. Now remember, theoretically it's quite possible. I mean, antimatter can technically form chunks very similar to typical matter and thus form larger and larger chunks until they form planets and stars. But because we've never seen this before anywhere and because antimatter seems to have so far been elusive, it's still a really big assumption. And based on the observation of these stars, they also try to predict how many antimatter stars might be in a galaxy in total. Right now, the assumption is that for approximately 400,000 regular stars, there might be one antimatter star somewhere. Which surprisingly also implies that there's maybe about a million antimatter stars in the entire Milky Way galaxy. But that's of course just an assumption for now. 
On the other hand, they also speculated about the existence of these antimatter stars on the outskirts of a galaxy. And in this case, a halo of a galaxy might contain billions of these antimatter stars, something that currently would be very difficult to detect or to test. And these types of emissions could only be produced and observed if a really large chunk of regular matter, such as for example an interstellar comet, pretty much smacks right into that antimatter star. That would obviously annihilate the matter and antimatter and produce those gamma rays. But at the moment, it's still kind of almost impossible to say what exactly it is we're looking at. Obviously, these could be gamma ray sources from some entirely different phenomenon, from something completely different that could also have a really good explanation. For example, to make sure that this is not a neutron star or some sort of a pulsar, and that these gamma ray emissions are not your typical gamma ray emissions coming from pulsars, further observations of these particular points would be required using optical and also radio wave light. So if we do see a lot of radio waves coming from this region or very periodic activity, it's more likely to be some sort of an unusual neutron star or a pulsar. So there are still quite a lot of questions to answer and still quite a lot of evidence to collect. Nevertheless, a really interesting proposition and a pretty interesting discovery. And a discovery that might help us get a little bit closer to solving that mystery of antimatter. Where is it hiding? What happened to it? And why is it that it's not really anywhere else in the universe at least to the point where it's basically colliding and destroying regular matter. But in some sense, it's actually good that it's not here. Obviously, we don't want to get destroyed by antimatter, even though we would like to find a very effective way of producing it. Being able to produce antimatter somehow would actually solve a lot of problems for us, including problems with energy. Like I said, it's a very expensive material to make, but it's also a very useful material, something that humanity might actually be able to produce one day to take us to a completely new level. Hello wonderful person, this is Anton, and today we're going to be discussing a new discovery coming from our own galaxy, the Milky Way, with the scientists finding an unusual empty cavity in space that seems to stretch across several hundred light years. A cavity that they refer to as the Perseus Taurus Supershell, the simulation of which you see right here. And although its formation and its creation is actually not anything mysterious and has a pretty reasonable explanation, what's really exciting about the study is, well, first of all, how it was presented, and second of all, the tools the scientists use to help us visualize all of this using our phones and using our computers. But first of all, so what exactly are we actually talking about and what is this super shell made out of? Well, in a nutshell, we're talking about molecular clouds, the objects that are sometimes known as the stellar nurseries. These are the objects that usually form some of the most beautiful creations in the universe and are also known for some of the most iconic images taken by the Hubble telescope. A typical molecular cloud is essentially where pretty much most of the stars in the universe were formed at some point in the past. And there are quite a lot of them around us. But because up to this point we mostly only studied them in two dimensions, basically because that's the image we see from planet Earth, the actual dynamics inside of them and how stars form inside of them has only been known to us based on various simulations. As a matter of fact, at least one previous video discussed this using some of the recent simulations using supercomputers. But it's more important for us to understand how the molecular clouds work in real life. And to understand this, we actually have to try to figure out how to form their three-dimensional shapes. And so just to illustrate this, so for example, the famous Orion molecular cloud, the part of the Orion nebula, kind of looks like this from planet Earth. But in reality, if you were to start rotating it and trying to discern its three-dimensional shape, you will start discovering some other features that were previously invisible. Specifically features that could maybe help us figure out how all of this evolved and how some of these stars acquired certain parameters or certain molecular compositions, including of course how some of them ended up producing planets and others ended up being too massive and going supernova. And so in the past few years, based on the observations from the famous Gaia telescope, that's been busy creating an extremely accurate three-dimensional map of the nearby space, the scientists from one of these studies were able to create several extremely accurate three-dimensional maps of several very well-known molecular clouds whose actual maps you can find by using the link in the description below. And so in this particular case, just by clicking on one of these links, you can see what all of this looks like in three dimensions, including all of these stars that were discovered so far. But when the scientists were studying two of these molecular clouds, 
The two very well known clouds known as the Perseus Molecular Cloud and the Taurus Molecular Clouds, they've discovered something they didn't expect. They discovered an unusual empty cavity that contained nothing between them that seemed to be spherical in size. But to try to understand what all of this means, let's actually take a look at the two-dimensional map first to try to figure out where both of these clouds are located in relation to planet Earth. This map you see right here shows us where a lot of the molecular clouds are located, representing a relatively large chunk of the night skies. Now if we zoom in to the left part of the map, you'll see that both the Perseus cloud and the Taurus clouds are our neighbors, they are located very close to each other with both of the clouds being relatively well known and also being relatively well studied. So for example, the Taurus cloud right here might actually be one of the closest molecular clouds to us at a distance of just 430 light years away from us, and it contains several hundred stars that are being formed there right now. In contrast, the Perseus cloud is more or less invisible in optical light, but extremely easily visible in the infrared, and contains up to about 10,000 masses of the sun, that at some point are going to create new stars, with obviously some of the stars already being formed there as well. But after the 3D maps became available, the scientists studying these two clouds realized something unusual happening right between them. They seem to contain a kind of an empty sphere. A sphere that you can kind of see right here in this beautiful simulation created by the scientists. So essentially this right here is the Taurus cloud, whereas this is the Perseus cloud, and right between them there's basically nothing for hundreds of light years, but at the same time it seems to be somewhat spherical in shape. And this is the formation the scientists are currently referring to as the Perseus-Taurus supershell. But what exactly is this and how exactly was it formed? Well, the simulation you can find in the description presents the potential formation of all of this. It probably involved either one extremely massive supernova or a lot of smaller supernova over a short period of time. And it probably began like this. There was a very, very large single cloud, and the various supernova on the inside created a kind of a spherical cavity. Basically, the supernova spread the gas in a spherical shape, creating the two molecular clouds we observe today. Which also means that both Perseus and Taurus clouds are technically a single cloud, with a kind of an empty bubble in between them. The bubble that's approximately 500 light years across. And based on the size of the cavity and things we know about supernova and molecular clouds, the estimates suggest that all of this started approximately 10 million years ago. So basically 10 million years ago, this was one large massive supercloud. But now after 10 million years, what we find instead is essentially an interesting spherical shell that contains a lot of different stars being formed right now, right on its surface, while interestingly nothing at all is being formed on the inside. Although before we go on, let's actually talk about this simulation right here. And this is sort of the second part or the second important part of this particular study. This is the new way that the scientists decided to present their discovery. Something you can learn more about by using the link in the description below. And in this case, we're talking about the augmented reality presentation. Or in other words, by using the link in the description and then by clicking play right here, or by scanning this QR code with your phone, you can then see all of this, the entire structure, in three dimensions and possibly even have it formed right on your table to essentially explore it in detail and to help you visualize exactly what the scientists discovered. And though it might not sound really useful and might sound like just a gimmick, this is actually a really important step in presenting scientific discoveries. By essentially helping us to visualize what the scientists discovered here, and more importantly, by helping us explore it in our own time using our own devices, this right here becomes so much more educational, so much more interactive, and actually so much more fun. The study that I'm sure most of you will probably not read at all, pretty much comes to life once you scan the QR code or open one of the links in the description. Which sort of connects to this other paper that's totally not related to space science, but is related to, well, to some extent, how we perceive things and how we learn things as humans, the paper known as the paper of the future. And here the scientists sort of identify various ways of presenting data and presenting information to make it a little bit more clear and to help people avoid various misconceptions. With the idea of augmented reality or even virtual reality being one of these potential presentation techniques. And in this particular case, honestly I'd have to say it worked pretty well. 
I mean, the discovery itself is not super groundbreaking. Yeah, it's a spherical cloud, and it seems to be nothing, it's empty inside. But just being able to visualize it, to explore it, and to sort of imagine what it really looks like, somewhere, I guess, right there where the uh, Taurus and Perseus clouds are located, it really makes it a lot more, well, special. It makes it more interactive, and it makes it more interesting. And so one of the main points the scientists are trying to make through these studies is basically the paper presentation and the way we describe science has to sort of change. Videos enhance visuals, but at the same time new technologies like augmented reality or virtual reality can help the scientists to explain their concepts to a much wider audience and thus avoid a lot of misconceptions and a lot of so-called fake news. And so this presentation right here is the first ever astronomical augmented reality paper, which by itself is really really cool. But I definitely hope to see more of this in a lot more studies. Because obviously it makes my job kind of easier, but it also makes it so much easier for people listening, for people watching, or for people who read in various articles on the web. By being able to actually do this with your phone and then explore it using your fingers just makes it so much more engaging and so much more interesting. But I guess when it comes to the actual discovery from the paper, well, we now have an extremely accurate three-dimensional map of this particular cloud, or these two clouds, and a lot of other molecular clouds whose actual parameters have now been established with only about 1% error. And all of this will now allow the scientists to try to understand how the gas itself rearranges in order to form various stars, and how various molecular clouds end up producing certain types of stars. Hello wonderful person, this is Anton, and today we're going to be talking about this relatively recent paper that makes a somewhat unusual and somewhat exciting suggestion. The suggestion that our solar system seems to be in the middle of a really really large magnetic tunnel. The tunnel that we seem to be flying through, but not really in the way that you see in the simulation here. Here we're actually going across the tunnel, mostly because it was probably produced a long time ago by a lot of different events. So let's talk a little bit more about this and also discuss the idea behind this and if it actually has any merit. But let's start right here, in the fish tank. So as a fish, you're probably not really aware about where you live in. As a matter of fact, even if fish were somewhat intelligent, they would probably not actually be able to tell the shape of their fish tank or be able to understand what sort of an environment is around them simply because it's very very difficult to see the outside from within. Similarly, here on planet Earth, and even in the solar system, it is very very difficult for us to see our surroundings. So for example, it took us a while to figure out what the shape of our galaxy is, and it's only recently we realized our galaxy is not entirely flat, it seems to have unusual formations and somewhat unusual deformations, including unusual ripples and of course the folds that you see in the simulation right here. But we've discussed a lot of these discoveries in the last few years as essentially the scientists made these discoveries. And it shouldn't really come as a surprise if we discover something entirely different and something that was always there but we just never noticed it. Which is more or less what happened in this particular study from University of Toronto with the scientists realizing that some of the features we've been observing in radio waves might actually be connecting in a kind of a tunnel-like formation. And it just so happens that we're sort of in the middle of this particular tunnel. Okay, so let's take baby steps. This is the Milky Way from planet Earth as it appears to us in visible light. Here's what it sort of looks like in radio light. In the last few years, specifically in the last decade, the radio astronomy sort of exploded. There is a tremendous number of various very powerful telescopes constantly scanning the skies. And a lot of new mysteries have already been discovered by a lot of these various radio telescopes. As a matter of fact, most of the modern astronomical mysteries, for the most part, usually come from radio telescopes, not really from a lot of other observations. And so when it comes to astronomy, we're definitely sort of in the golden age of radio astronomy. So here is the same image, but this time in radio waves. If you were to sort of start zooming in at some of these formations in more detail, you would start discovering a lot of different formations in a lot of different parts of the sky, such as for example the Centaurus A galaxy you see right here, or various objects in the Cygnus area, but the origin and the general formation of some other objects is still more or less mysterious. One of these objects is right here, known as the North Polar Spur. 
It's actually visible in a lot of different frequencies. This is from the Erosita, this is in the X-rays. And you can see that this large formation here, that's also the same North Polar Spur. It seems to be a pretty large object, and it seems to be about 500 light years away from us, but what exactly made it is not really known to us. And generally there are quite a lot of different formations whose origin is still not really known. For example, there is another region known as the Fan region that you see right here. And a lot of these errors are pointing at some of the other unusual formations, different loops and different spurs. Now, today we believe that in most cases they were probably produced by very powerful explosions. So it's quite likely that most of them probably came to be as a result of some sort of a supernova or some kind of a similar very powerful event. But the thing is, by looking at all of this from planet Earth, all of this sort of seems more or less isolated and to some extent more or less disconnected. In other words, the connection between these objects does not seem to be apparent. But this particular answer wasn't really satisfying for the scientist behind this paper, Jennifer West, who as you can see in this picture is definitely wearing her hard hat with a style. Somehow she had the hunch that there was a connection between some of these objects. And so by using various computer models and by essentially trying to imagine all of this in three dimensions, her team realized that a lot of this might actually just look like this simply because of what's happening around us. It's as if all of this was tunnel only visible in radio light, with a lot of these formations simply being the result of our perspective, or essentially where we're looking at this from. And so in this case, imagine you're driving through a tunnel, and imagine all these shapes that form around you. Okay, you don't really have to imagine it, you can always look at this image. So all of these different shapes that form inside the tunnel seem to be kind of similar to what we see around us as well. The fan region right here, the north polar spur, and a lot of other formations right here, morphologically seem to represent a kind of a tunnel-like structure that we seem to be located inside. But once again, the clarification here is that we're not moving through the tunnel in this way. We're not actually flying through the tunnel. In this case, it's a lot more likely that the tunnel is actually stationary and is moving with planet Earth across the galaxy. But some of these particles are definitely following the magnetic lines across the galaxy as well. Here is another way to try to imagine what all of this looks like. If our sun is right here in the middle, you can kind of see that there are quite a lot of these loop-like formations forming an almost tunnel-like structure, which from the top also might look something like this, or something like this, with the tunnel itself, as you can see, being approximately 1000 light years in length. But even though this is referred to as the magnetic tunnel, it's not really the type of electricity and magnetism we have here on planet Earth. As a matter of fact, it doesn't even look like this. Here, the gas is really, really diffuse, and the actual magnetism is, for the most part, relatively weak. But it's still there, and forms these very, very long filamental structures that sort of represent the magnetic lines of a typical galaxy, something that we've seen before in some of the other galaxies as well. Here's, for example, a radio and optical image of a distant galaxy known as NGC 4217. And notice how we were able to capture all of these different radio filaments or magnetic lines inside the galaxy itself. So it would not really be surprising that the Milky Way has these as well. And it just so happens that we seem to be located right in the center of one of these filaments. Or I guess almost at the center. There is still some gaps here and there. And so if our eyes could somehow see the radio waves, it's quite possible that we would be seeing something that might resemble this. Well, not really as perfectly circular though. We would definitely see the arc shapes, but maybe not the full circle. And in terms of what all of this is made out of, well, it's probably ionized hydrogen. A lot of hydrogen that was probably produced by a distant supernova long time ago. Although the true origin of this is still obviously not known to us. For all we know, maybe a lot of these uh, filamental formations inside galaxies are formed in some other unusual way. But I guess what's really impressive about this particular study is the fact that since we've known about these structures since the early 60s, it's really really awesome to hear that after 60 years, someone realized that there seems to be a connection between all of them. Now obviously this is just the first study and the preliminary study that still needs to be confirmed by other scientists, but at the moment this looks really really promising. So far this paper received a lot of positive feedback and a lot of scientists are actually kind of surprised by this discovery. More importantly, it would be really nice to see a much better representation and a much better simulation of what's actually happening here based on modeling techniques that use a little bit more detail and have a little bit more data to work with. 
And doing this would be really important, mostly because a lot of this is based on mysteries we are currently trying to work out. The mysteries of the magnetic fields and various magnetic interactions inside typical galaxies. In one of the previous videos from not so long ago, we've discussed that some of these magnetic filaments have already been discovered very very close to the center of our galaxy, but now we seem to have found some of them even closer to us. And so the origin of these filaments and also what sort of effects they have on, for example, star formation would be really important to investigate. And so hopefully in the next few years, once we have more detailed maps and more detailed modeling, we'll start getting a better picture of what exactly is happening with this magnetic tunnel that we seem to be flying through. And since we know that in a lot of stars and also around various black holes, various magnetic filaments play a really important role in delivering massive amounts of material into, for example, a star or a black hole, and because we also know that a lot of massive planets usually form in a very similar manner as well, trying to understand the exact purpose of these filaments would be pretty important in understanding the way that galaxies evolve and the way that they grow as well. Hello wonderful person, this is Anton, and today we're going to be talking about another discovery coming from the Milky Way galaxy. A discovery of some really unusually large structure. Possibly one of the largest structures discovered in the last few years. But what exactly this structure is, and how it was formed, is not something we can actually answer right now. And that's because even right now the scientists are not entirely sure what they're looking at. On the one hand, it could be some sort of a large gas filament. A huge amount of gas, thousands and thousands of light years in length. But on the other hand, it could also be a galactic arm. Which I guess is sort of possible and would mean that our galaxy now has an extra arm. But all of this is currently unknown to us simply because this is a completely new discovery. So let's start with what we know. Let's start with the discovery and also with what we know about the galaxy itself. Now, generally speaking, because of our location in within the galaxy, it's almost impossible for us to see what the galaxy looks like or to try to imagine what the shape of the galaxy even is. As a matter of fact, it took decades and decades of three-dimensional analysis to sort of figure out that our galaxy was most likely a spiral galaxy with several arms. Possibly somewhat similar to some of the other galaxies, such as the Andromeda. But the scientists did not figure this out by looking at stars or by looking at star motion. They actually figured this out by looking at something entirely different. The motion of hydrogen gas. And specifically here by measuring what's known as the hydrogen line. Hydrogen line refers to an extremely specific frequency of 1.42 GHz that's occasionally emitted by a hydrogen atom when the electron goes through its spin change. The actual process is sort of complicated for a single video, but we know that this is a fact and we know that these hydrogen lines are emitted by hydrogen gas. And because the hydrogen line emissions are so specific, the actual frequency is so specific, the changes in the frequency allow the scientists to measure how the gas moves across the galaxy, which allow the scientists to do a lot of things and a lot of different calculations in regards to the Milky Way. First of all, it allowed the scientists to calculate the speed with which our galaxy was spinning in different parts of the galaxy. This is known as the galactic rotation curve. At the same time, by using the estimates from the rotation curve, they could then start using this data to try to calculate distances to various objects and to various galactic arms. Over time, this allowed the scientists to work out the general structure of our own galaxy, identifying the four major galactic arms present in the Milky Way galaxy. Or in other words, the scientists realized that our galaxy, the Milky Way, seems to have four major galactic arms. It would sort of maybe look like this if you were to look at it from the outside. Although in this case, there would also be a lot of material around the galaxy as well. But over time, they also discovered some additional arms that were sort of partial or they were not really complete. For example, there's one right here, the so-called New Outer Arm. And there's also a tiny one right here known as the Orion Cygnus which is, by the way, where the solar system is located as well. And so all of this was essentially done by measuring various gas moving across the galaxy, and specifically identifying the location and the velocity of the gas. And because all of this just requires a radio telescope, it essentially can be done from any part of the planet. These types of radio waves usually go through our planet and can be detected by any radio telescope pretty much anywhere. You can technically even build one yourself. The frequency here is not very different from a typical Wi-Fi antenna or from a typical antenna used in um, telecommunication. But naturally, for some of the more detailed observations or for something really, really far away, you would require a pretty large telescope. Maybe even the largest telescope. 
like you know, the one in China called Fast, the one that we can sort of check out by using Google Earth and by looking at it from a distance of a few hundred meters. This is the largest radio telescope we have right now, it's approximately half a kilometer in diameter. And having become fully functional and fully operational last year, this is now probably the most exciting radio telescope on the planet. Especially because the Arecibo is no longer operational. And so by using this telescope, the scientists behind the paper you can find in the description below decided to see if they can find some unusual hydrogen lines somewhere else out there. And they seem to have identified something they refer to as the cattail. Or is it cattail? I'm not sure. Anyway, so they found something. And that something is in a very strange location. It's sort of somewhere right here. Now remember, we are in this region. So this is almost on the other side of the galaxy, which would kind of make sense that we didn't actually get to see it before. And it's also pretty far away, roughly around 72,000 light years away from us. And so literally on the outskirts of the other side of the galaxy. And that's of course the region that we don't really get to see much, we don't really get to study much, but also a region that's probably hiding a lot of interesting things. With this one potentially being one of them. But before we go on, well, let's talk about the discovery from last year. Last year I've talked about the discovery of what the scientists referred to as the Radcliffe Wave. This was an unusually large formation several thousand light years in length that seemed to be super close to our own planet. And it was always there, but we've only discovered it last year. And that's because our techniques and also our instruments have improved so much that we can now see things that were always there, but we just couldn't see them before. You can find more information in the video somewhere right there. Anyway, so it shouldn't really come as a surprise that we've discovered something else, possibly even a completely new galactic arm. Especially because even though there are four major arms in the galaxy, there seem to be a lot of minor ones here and there as well, with this really really large one discovered a couple of decades ago. Now obviously there's no explanation for why these smaller arms exist, or actually even why large arms exist, or how galaxies acquire arms, but it's clear that it's definitely possible. As a matter of fact, it's sort of important to understand that arms are not actually structures. A more appropriate definition for them would be over densities. These are sort of like crests of waves. So just like a typical wave will create a wave-like formation with certain parts of the wave being more dense than other parts, in a typical spiral galaxy you'll find something relatively similar. And in this case, if you were to try to trace a path of a single star across the galactic arm, you'll actually realize that the material goes inside the arm, stays in there for a little bit, and then leaves afterwards. So these are not permanent objects, they're just over densities. There's just more stuff inside of them than outside of them. But their actual origin, or why there are like four of them here, or why smaller ones exist, all of this is sort of beyond the explanation right now. There are a lot of different suggestions, but no specific theories explaining everything. And so what exactly do we know about this formation? Cattail. Cattail. Well, first of all, the way all of this was measured is by trying to measure the velocity of this gas, and specifically the difference of velocity. For example, they've discovered that on average, certain parts of this gas was traveling at about 150 km per second, but the velocity range was between 170 km per second, a little bit closer to the galaxy, and 130 km per second, a little bit farther away, with a total mass of material present in this gas being about 65,000 masses of the Sun. So this is a huge chunk of gas very likely just as big as the Radcliffe wave I previously mentioned. But if this is just a gas, or if it's just some sort of a gas filament, this will be the most unusual, farthest gas filament ever found. And it would also be very difficult to explain its origins. Maybe it's some sort of a broken down galactic arm, or maybe it was created in some other way from a galaxy that was absorbed a long time ago. Right now there's really no explanation. If, however, this is actually a part of another galactic arm, it doesn't seem to match the galactic plane. As a matter of fact, it seems to be sort of warped. And if so, something really massive must have warped it. So there's even more mystery there as well. And in terms of the actual size of this object, it seems to be about 3600 light years in length and approximately 670 light years in width. But the scientists here suggest that the length could be actually up to about 16,000 light years making this one of the most unusual and one of the largest objects in the galaxy. And because this image sort of shows us that it's not actually connected to the galactic arm and seems to be completely by itself, right now it doesn't really have a very good explanation. But it would still not be unusual. Remember, Radcliffe Wave is roughly around 9000 light years in length. And this was hiding right at our doorsteps. So discovering something like this farther away is not really unexpected. But trying to explain this is still going to be difficult. So for example, we know that most gas filaments, especially larger gas filaments, 
normally are much much closer to the center of the galaxy. So what exactly happened here? How did this end up so far away? But if this is not a gas filament but some sort of a disturbed galactic arm, then I guess the next question is what exactly happened to our galaxy a long time ago to disturb a galaxy in order to sort of separate one of the arms? With the next obvious question of course being what arm did this come from? Obviously to disturb a galactic arm you would have to have some sort of a major collision and possibly some other major disturbance in order to actually create two arms out of a single galactic arm. But if this is a result of some sort of a massive galactic collision, well then there's a whole new set of questions that needs to be answered as well. Which galaxy? When did it happen? What exactly happened to this galaxy? And why is it that only this part of the galaxy was disturbed but nothing else? And so because of this, at the moment, Cattail provides a lot more questions than answers. Actually, everything about it is a question. At this point, I would even question the name. Cattail or Cattail? Also, where's the rest of the cat? And so unfortunately, that's kind of all we know for now. We know it's there, we know that it seems to be some sort of a chunk of gas, and it seems to be a really large piece of gas. But other than that, nobody knows where it came from. Hello wonderful person, this is Anton, and today we're going to be talking about a pretty incredible discovery that was always there, right in front of us, but we just didn't really see it. The discovery of this absolutely colossal object that represents the largest supernova remnant we've ever seen. Something that's about 90 times the size of the full moon in the night skies. But the thing is, we've only discovered it now. So something is definitely not adding up here. But let me explain to you what's going on and why this is actually a pretty big discovery. First of all, light, or light spectrum as it's known, is basically something that we use to perceive the world around us. But the thing is, our eyes are only capable of receiving about 0.0035% of the entire light spectrum, meaning that 99 point, what is this, like 9965% of the light spectrum is actually invisible to us. Did I get this right? Which means that there are definitely a lot of things out there in the beautiful night skies that are actually invisible to our eyes. And one of these objects was of course that supernova we just recently discovered. And we know that supernova remnants are actually all over the place. Like there's this beautiful one you see right here, there's also another one that's a little bit behind it. So these objects are pretty common. But because they're so large and also because they're so vibrant, it's usually really easy to see them, at least in certain frequencies, in certain uh, spectra of light. And generally, we believe that approximately every 30 to 50 years, there's going to be a supernova producing these supernova remnants somewhere in our galaxy. Here's actually an image from 1994 of a type 1 supernova from another galaxy, something that we know happens in our own galaxy as well. And though there should be around 1200 supernova visible to us, at least statistically speaking, we've so far only discovered about 300 or so. And so a huge majority of these supernova are somehow invisible to us. Now not so long ago, I've talked about this unusual discovery of another supernova that was only visible in infrared light and also another supernova that was only visible in the X-ray light. And a lot of these new discoveries were only made because we now have a lot of really powerful telescopes specializing in those frequencies of light. And specifically for this study that we're discussing today, which as always you can find in the description below. All of this relates to this beautiful German slash Russian telescope known as Erosita that was launched approximately two years ago and since then was able to produce a lot of different discoveries including the most accurate X-ray map we have so far of the night skies. The map that has already helped us discover some really incredible features in a galaxy that I've discussed in one of the previous videos. Anyway, so a lot of these new discoveries are essentially because of these incredible new telescopes. And one of these discoveries made completely by accident was once again a strange and really large supernova-like shape which the scientists now believe was produced by a supernova for sure. That probably happened anywhere from about 21,000 years ago to maybe about 150,000 years ago. And unlike previous unusual discoveries coming from this telescope including these unusual circles that we've discussed in the previous video, this one seems to possess an extremely typical of supernova shape. It really looks like a cloud, but it's only visible in the X-rays. Here's actually a more realistic picture of this showing where it's located and also showing that, um, well, it is kind of difficult to see, but it's definitely there. The scientists decided to name this Hoinga, which apparently is a medieval name for the town where the main scientist is from. So basically it's named after the town where he was born. But considering the fact that it's about 90 times the size of the full moon in the night skies, how is it that we missed it for so long? Well, apparently, according to the scientists, 
we didn't really miss it, it just nobody noticed that it was a supernova remnant until now. The previous X-ray telescope that was used by a lot of scientists, known as RULESAT, apparently has seen it as well. Here's an image from that particular telescope, but for some reason it was missed until now. Probably because Irusita just has much better resolution, much better sensors, and is able to create much more vibrant images, something that previous telescopes just couldn't do. And because of this, the scientists were definitely able to see this and realized exactly what they were looking at. And by the way, just to give you a perspective of how extremely large this object is, let me try to use this representation of the night skies that was produced by Erosita, and we've talked about this in one of the previous videos. So this right here is the Milky Way galaxy. These are the large Fermi bubbles that we've discovered not so long ago. And right about here, right in this location, that's the size of this object. So this chunk right here, or let me actually increase the resolution here, that's basically it. And that's a really, really large object. It actually appears to be one of the largest X-ray objects we've detected in the galaxy. And so, so far, Erosita has definitely helped the scientists to discover a lot of objects that were previously completely invisible to us or were missed for one reason or another. But the other interesting discovery in regards to this is actually the location of the supernova. Now, normally, most of the supernova we discover are in the galactic plane itself. More often, though, these remnants are found closer to the center of the galaxy, mostly because that's where we usually find a lot of massive stars that typically produce type 2 supernova. Type 2 supernova, as a reminder, is when a very massive star suddenly collapses, creating a really large explosion, which is the supernova remnant, and leaving behind a neutron star or a black hole. But it just so happens that this particular supernova, that we can refer to as Hoinga for now, is basically not in the galactic plane, it's a little bit above it something that's sort of visible in this image right here. Now, what does this mean? Well, this kind of implies that it was probably produced through the other type of a supernova that usually leaves behind really large remnants. That's, of course, type 1a supernova, which happens when a white dwarf, such as what our sun is going to become in the next few billions of years, basically reaches instability either because of some mass coming from another star or because it collides with another white dwarf. When this happens, when this so-called Chandrasekhar limit is reached, it kind of undergoes a lot of instability on the inside and eventually explodes, releasing a tremendous amount of energy and a huge amount of material. And these types of supernova, these type 1a supernova, can happen anywhere in the galaxy or can even happen outside of a galaxy, like in this case right here, that we've observed back in 1994. And in some cases, especially when it happens outside of the galactic plane, as all of this material expands, in order for it to be observable from Earth, it actually has to interact with something. In some cases, it's gas from other stars or basically interstellar gas, but in other cases, it could be some other particles. But because this particular supernova seemed to have happened outside of the galactic plane, there's probably just not as much material for it to interact with, and it's thus unable to produce optical light. But it's interacting with something because it's producing X-rays and also seems to produce infrared light as well. So this is actually a great opportunity for scientists to try to understand what happens outside of the galactic plane and to maybe even discover some other mysterious particles like the dark matter particles. With the other implication, of course, being that there's probably a lot more of these supernova hiding all over the place, just in the spectrum of light that's not visible to us, not visible to Erosita, and currently not visible to any other telescopes. Which, of course, just means that maybe we'll just have to start producing telescopes that can observe other spectra of light as well. It's obviously going to be expensive and might require a lot more effort, but I think it's worth it. We might discover a lot more mysteries and a lot more unusual events somewhere out there that we've never knew existed. And also since approximately 9% of all of the stars in the galaxy are white dwarfs that could hypothetically explode and produce these supernova remnants, it only implies that a lot of these supernova remnants are all over the place, but we just don't have any ability to see them just yet. Although at the moment, there are still even a lot of questions about this particular remnant. Even the distance to this remnant is not currently known. The estimates suggest that it's either between about 1500 to maybe 4000 light years away from us, but if it's much closer to us, then it means that it's probably even larger in size than we initially assumed. And so more observations are needed from probably other telescopes or from using other sources of light like infrared to essentially try to determine how far away this object really is from us. 
Either way, it's a super exciting discovery, something that a lot of scientists and a lot of astronomers always dream about, finding something really incredible somewhere out there, something that no one else discovered. And in this particular case, it literally was there this whole time. It just, nobody really noticed it. Or maybe people have, but they thought someone else has discovered it. Whoa, okay, that is pretty cool. Hello wonderful person, this is Anton, and today we're going to be talking about what seems to be the most accurate, the most detailed, and actually one of the coolest maps I've seen in quite a while. The map of the nearby 10 parsec, or about 32.6 light years away from planet Earth, showing us pretty much every single star, every brown dwarf, all of the white dwarfs, all of the planets, and of course, some of the other major objects, with extremely accurate distances to those objects as well. A map that was a part of this paper right here that was recently published by these European scientists. And because this map is actually interactive and you, you can even zoom in here and go into detail and check out pretty much most of the objects near us, I figured this is actually one of the coolest things I've seen in quite a while. And so let's talk a little bit more about this because this is actually a pretty cool creation and there are some objects in there that might be of interest to you as well. So first of all, when it comes to different types of maps, we obviously have a pretty decent map of the solar system and of course different types of maps showing us all of the major objects and their moons in the solar system. Although generally these are usually not to scale simply because you would not be able to see planets if these maps were to scale. On the other side of the spectrum we also have these really cool maps of the universe with one of the recent maps I've talked about that was essentially the most accurate map of the universe near us a representation of which you can see right here, but these are obviously not very detailed because we're still learning about the universe and there are still a lot of undiscovered areas in the universe. So we definitely still have a long way to go before we have a really accurate map of even our own galaxy. But when it comes to mapping nearby space, we've done a pretty good job of the nearby, I would say about 10 light years, generally showing us what all of this looks like if we were to sort of zoom out and to try to find different types of stars and obviously different types of planets around those stars. But since we are constantly discovering new objects, new brown dwarfs, new planets and so on in the nearby space, these maps are still not entirely complete and obviously will always have to be updated as well. Which is why the scientists behind this paper decided to create this interactive website that essentially is going to serve as a kind of a map that's going to be updated with time, very accurately showing us the nearby 10 parsec or 32.6 light years away from planet Earth, with 540 different objects marked at the relative location and the distance away from planet Earth. But obviously this is a two-dimensional map trying to represent three-dimensional space, so it's not super accurate, but it is accurate enough and useful enough for us humans and also serves as an excellent guide to basically sort of direct us towards some of the nearest interesting objects in outer space. And also obviously serves a very important educational purpose as well. Although, okay, I need to actually clarify something before I go on. Because this is a projection of three dimensions onto a 2D space, this might become confusing because, for example, right here, the nearest object to us, Proxima Centauri, seems to be a little bit farther away than some of the other objects. But that's because we're looking at this from the top. In other words, it doesn't show us the true distance. To find the true distance, we also have to take a look at this number in brackets, which kind of shows us the distance below or above the plane we're looking at. In other words, this is also about two units below this map, so it's actually a little bit farther than Proxima Centauri, which is in the same plane as the solar system. And so in that sense, it's still a little bit complicated to read this, but it is nevertheless a really good map showing us the nearby 33 light years away from planet Earth. And to create this map and to create such an accurate map, the scientists use the ESA's Gaia telescope that is extremely good at marking the location and the distance to every nearby object. And so in terms of distances and obviously position in the sky, this right now is an extremely accurate representation of nearby space. But one of the major differences between this map and some of the other maps in the past that often included similar objects is of course the presence of some of the other objects here as well. So first of all, a lot of brown dwarfs have been added and many of these have only been discovered in the last few years. And also as you can see, each of these objects also now has the number of planets around them, including the names of those planets if they exist. 
And so here you can easily see some of the nearest planets and also some of the nearest interesting brown dwarfs to us. On top of this, it visually shows us what types of stars there are and if those stars are binary, trinary, quadruple or even quintuple stars, meaning that there are five stars in the system. And surprisingly, there are quite a few of those as well. There are at least three different quadruple stars and at least two star systems that have five stars in them. But I'm not going to spoil it for you or try to find it for you. Try to figure this out by yourself because it's actually kind of fun trying to explore this and to see something that you might have never known before. There are also 19 different triple star systems and a surprisingly high number of binary stars as well, 69 to be more precise. This also serves as an extremely important sample for statistical purposes, because using this we can now try to estimate the total number of things in the galaxy and maybe even then try to estimate the total number of planets and stars in other galaxies as well. And so, for example, out of 540 objects in this map, 89 are brown dwarfs, 249 objects are red dwarfs, such as the nearest star to us, Proxima Centauri, 21 are white dwarfs, which is essentially what our sun is going to become in approximately 5 billion years, and 18 of them are stars very similar to our own sun, G-type stars. And so this does kind of help us understand the general distribution of different types of objects in a volume of space in the Milky Way galaxy, or at least in our part of the Milky Way galaxy. But it can obviously be used to extrapolate the presence of these objects in other parts of the galaxy as well. But in this paper, scientists do mention that we're probably going to be discovering a lot more brown dwarfs in the next few years, mostly because they're kind of difficult to see. We also might find some other faint objects, such as rogue planets, and definitely find a lot of exoplanets as well. Currently, there are 77 on this list, but chances are that each of these star systems will have at least 5 to maybe even 10, kind of similar to what the solar system has as well. And so definitely a really cool sample and a really cool map. And if you get to look at this yourself, and also if you get to explore this in your free time, you might discover some really cool objects that you've never known about before. So for example, in one of the previous videos, I've already mentioned these uh, so-called local clouds. There's a G cloud right here, and there's also something known as the local interstellar cloud. And that relates to something that we've discovered not so long ago, which is sort of a, an assumption that we're flying through some sort of an ancient supernova, and some sort of a molecular cloud left by an exploding star a long time ago. But we're currently sort of on the edge of one of these clouds, the local cloud, and we're moving this way and we'll most likely be entering G cloud, another cloud, in a few thousand or maybe tens of thousands of years. Now obviously we don't really know what effect this is going to have on planet Earth, and if any, but from what the scientists understand today, the solar system most likely stayed in this region for at least 40 to maybe even 150,000 years. And back in 2019, scientists studying the samples of ice in Antarctica discovered that this ice contained the iron, interstellar iron, that most likely came from this local region known as the local fluff or the local interstellar cloud. So in some sense, it definitely affects our planet to some extent because all of this stuff enters the atmosphere but we just don't really know what these effects are. And by the way, this cloud itself is pretty hot as well. It's close to about 7000 degrees Celsius or about 12,000 Fahrenheit. But because there is so little stuff in this cloud, it's actually not dense at all, it means that generally you would not actually detect any of this heat, which is most likely the reason why this cloud is still there and why it's able to maintain its shape. It's almost like the magnetic field is holding these particles close enough to one another, preventing it from falling apart, even though stars nearby will probably create a lot of solar wind that should technically break it apart. Or in other words, this is definitely a mysterious place that still has a lot to teach us and that we don't really know much about. And if you get to explore this map, you're going to discover that there are quite a lot of these clouds everywhere. And then you might also discover something that looks like this. These two red circles, known as the Stromgren spheres, which when very energized, sort of look like this. These are essentially regions, circular regions or spherical regions of highly ionized hydrogen gas. And usually they're ionized by an object, very active and very energetic object, right in the center. Typically this is an O or B type star, which is definitely the case for this object known as the Rosette Nebula. But it can also be created by other objects. In this case, this large one is created by the star known as Sirius B, which is right there. And that's of course a white dwarf. The smaller one that you see right here is created by another star, 
which happens to be also a white dwarf. And that's generally speaking because Sirius B is a pretty massive white dwarf with a lot of emissions coming from it in frequencies of light that are generally ionizing, including the ultraviolet light and the X-ray emissions that you see right here. And so the hydrogen that was already present here, most likely from some of these clouds I mentioned before, basically gets ionized and creates this um, somewhat visible formation around it. Although it wouldn't really be that easily visible and it does require specialized equipment to try to discover it. But for some of the more active objects, it's definitely visible as long as you have some sort of a telescope. And so generally speaking, the hotter and the more luminous the star is, the bigger the sphere is going to produce. Also surprisingly, the denser the region is, the more hydrogen gas there is, the smaller the sphere is produced. And so the difference between these two could be that this just has a lot more gas present and so it gets ionized and creates a much smaller sphere. Whereas here the gas could be just more diffuse. Although interestingly enough, it doesn't seem to reach as far away as the solar system, so we don't really know exactly what effects it might have if our planet was passing through these gas bubbles as well. Hello wonderful person, this is Anton, and today we're going to be talking about a possible solution to a mystery known as the mystery of missing baryonic matter. Something that has been bugging astrophysicists for quite a while now. But at the same time, we're going to be talking about this incredible discovery of what seems to be almost invisible gas not so far away from the solar system, something that scientists were quite surprised to discover. And all of this was done with a completely new technique, something that was never done before, a technique that used something known as rapid scintillations to discover this somewhat invisible or actually almost completely invisible gas. But first, well, let's I guess establish the problem we're trying to solve here. We know there are a lot of mysteries in the universe, we know there's a lot of stuff that's missing that should be there, and for example we know that the majority of stuff in the universe is the so-called dark energy. We don't really exactly understand it very well, but it seems to be responsible for allowing the universe to accelerate. We also know that about 31% of everything in the universe is the matter, the stuff that we should be able to detect. But unfortunately about 80% of it is really difficult to explain and we refer to it as dark matter. Now that's not really what we're solving today though, because even in this regular matter that's essentially visible to us, so that's things that we're made out of, things like stars, things like planets, even in there at least half of it seems to be missing. And based on various analysis of mass distribution and just general analysis of how much mass there should be in the universe. Now the idea here is that, well, half of it is missing, half of it is visible. But where is that missing half? And one of the previous studies from a few months ago discovered that some of it is hidden in the so-called cosmic web. It's basically a barely visible gas that stretches across the entire universe and forms these filaments that are very, very massive. Now technically this could explain the entire problem of this missing baryonic mass. But because this filament is relatively difficult to see, it's obviously difficult to estimate how much of the mass is in the filament. So some of the other sources, such as for example maybe gas around the galaxy, maybe gas hidden inside the galaxy, has always been the other suspect. And in this case, because this gas is somewhat difficult to see, or actually almost impossible to see, it's always been an assumption that nobody really knew how to prove. And one of the reasons why it's actually kind of difficult to detect any of this gas is, well, mostly because it's so diffuse, also because it's extremely cold so it doesn't actually emit any frequencies, any kind of light or really anything at all. And also obviously because the only gas we've seen so far in the galaxy, for example, is usually the gas that eventually ends up producing planets. We don't know if there's any other gas that's kind of neutral or if, if there's any gas that's maybe responsible for some other functions in the galaxy. Most of this is still new to us. But the main investigator in this paper, the one you can find in the description below, discovered an ingenious method to basically identify if there's any of this gas near us. And by trying to find as much of us close to us as we can in the next few years, we might be able to actually pinpoint how much of it could be hidden in the galaxy and how much could be responsible for this mysterious invisible baryonic matter. And remember, baryonic matter is just regular matter, it's the stuff we're made out of. So that's kind of what we're looking for here. And in a nutshell, what the scientists in this paper do is, well, it's actually quite brilliant. They basically just looked at distant galaxies and used them as something referred to as a scintillating pin. Now, it's a very difficult term to explain, but in a nutshell, what this means is they looked at how much these galaxies were twinkling. Now, we know that stars, for example, twinkle all the time. 
but the twinkles that we see from planet Earth, these are the effects produced by our atmosphere. Basically, as the light passes through the atmosphere, it gets diffracted just a little bit, enough to produce these unusual effects. This is not something you're going to see if you look into the stars, for example, from space. In space, they're not going to twinkle, they're going to be very solid points of light. At the same time, this is not something you should be seeing if you're looking at stars and galaxies using radio telescopes. Radio light or radio emissions go through the atmosphere without any interference. So in radio light, there should not be any twinkling of anything. But let's just say we use some sort of a really powerful and really famous telescope like the Australian square kilometer array that you see right here and take a look at some of the radio emissions coming from distant galaxies. You can actually explore this three-dimensional map that I talked about in one of the previous videos by using the link in the description. And let's just say that while looking at these radio emissions coming from distant galaxies, we start noticing that some of them also twinkle. In other words, they no longer produce a stable point, they start having unusual emissions, which we refer to as scintillations. Well, in this case, the only reasonable explanation is that it seems that the radio light must have passed something on the way to us, and that something refracted or changed the light coming toward us, in this case radio light, by interacting with the radio light using radio emissions. And by doing this to several different sources in the night skies, the scientists in this paper discovered five separate sources that seem to be forming some sort of a line in the night skies, all five being these twinkling radio sources, scintillating sources to be more exact, with other sources nearby not having this effect. And this of course implies that the light coming from these five sources must have passed through some sort of a cloud of gas invisible gas in this case, that was probably interacting with them and caused them to basically create these twinkling effects. Although in this case, unlike a typical twinkling star where the light changes its shape, in this case the light was actually changing its brightness, so this is really what the scintillation in this case means. And the most reasonable explanation so far suggests that this was probably some sort of a extremely cold hydrogen gas. Basically kind of like hydrogen snow in this sense and the total mass of this gas was most likely about the mass of our moon. So in other words, it's not really that massive, but it's very diffuse and it forms a really large structure. And this would be about 12 to 14 light years away from us, and the total length of this gas would only be about 0.2 light years. And that's kind of like if someone took our moon, then essentially converted the entire moon into some sort of a gas, cooled it down, stretched it into a very, very thin strip, and turn this into something that's about 0.2 light years in length. So, so far that's the best explanation. And the way that they think it was maybe created is when a star or some sort of a nearby massive object disrupted some sort of a large formation of hydrogen gas, which then formed this really long strip of hydrogen ice that is pretty much invisible in any condition other than if a radio wave passes through it. And because we know that hydrogen generally freezes at around a temperature of minus 260 degrees Celsius, and because it's also kind of difficult to see it otherwise, it would totally make sense that a lot of this missing baryonic matter was actually this somewhat diffuse and pretty much omnipresent hydrogen ice that's all over the place hiding in every galaxy, around galaxies, and between galaxies, basically forming all of these different structures that we just can't see yet mostly because we haven't really found a very good technique, except for the one mentioned in this paper. But for this technique to work better, and for us to discover even more of these unusual strips of gas or other gas formations, we would require hundreds and hundreds of hours of constant observation of the night skies, looking for these tiny effects of scintillation from all of these millions and millions of different radio galaxies that we've already discovered, and that we know produce a certain type of light, where any kind of a scintillation would be detected almost right away. But this would require a lot of observations and a lot of different studies. Although I guess the good news is that we now have a very solid technique and all of the methods and all of the math is already done. Someone just has to apply this similar technique to other observations. Now in the past other scintillations have actually been detected of course, but in this particular case this is the first time that multiple scintillations were detected from separate galaxies. And this is the only reason we know that this was probably a much larger object. If a single scintillation is detected, this doesn't unfortunately mean much. It could have been produced by a lot of different things, and so in this case, the goal is to really look for several events happening around a similar region. And this is obviously not the only method scientists have discovered so far to look for this invisible matter. For example, previous studies used radio bursts to try to discover any kind of unusual emissions or unusual scintillations in those bursts, 
And other studies looked at the emissions coming from distant galaxies as those emissions pass through the intergalactic web. All of this does suggest that the gas that's hidden is pretty much all over the place, but we don't really know what represents most of this mass. It could be inside galaxies, but it can also be hidden in some other unexpected place. Hello wonderful person, this is Anton, and today we're going to be talking about some really interesting discoveries coming from the Hyades cluster, the nearest star cluster to us. Because the recent research suggests something massive, something potentially groundbreaking, and something currently unknown disrupted the cluster millions of years ago, causing it to look somewhat different. With the main implication right now being that it might have been a very large chunk of dark matter. But let's talk about this a little bit more because a lot of details here require some basic understanding of how all of this was discovered and what it might mean to science. First of all, the Hyades cluster is relatively easy to see in the night skies. Here is roughly where you would find it and it sort of forms this interesting V-shape with a telescope image of the cluster resembling something like this. But even though it doesn't actually look that big and it doesn't look like there are a lot of stars here, that's because the majority of stars are barely visible. They're just really, really small and don't produce enough light. They're still there though, and they have been discovered using some of the more recent observations. And so even in this simulation, if we increase the magnitude, suddenly this cluster looks a lot more massive and possessing a lot more stars. And a lot of these stars, including some of the other stars in the vicinity, have been very thoroughly observed and very thoroughly tracked by the incredible Gaia telescope from the European Space Agency. The telescope has already made so many different incredible discoveries in the last few years, and it still keeps making more and more. And using the data from this telescope, the scientists were able to discover something else that, well, nobody really found before. Now, the strength of this telescope is that it's able to track the precise motion and precise parameters of pretty much most of the nearby stars to us, and even some of the stars beyond. And so it has some really extremely precise observations of the vector of the motion of all of the stars in the cluster. And so based on this, the scientists were initially able to find some of the nearby stars belonging to the cluster that were not visible before. And they did so by essentially comparing the velocities of the cluster to the velocities of some of the nearby stars that might have left the cluster due to various gravitational interactions. In other words, even though initially some of these clusters might look like this, through various tidal interactions and gravitational interactions with things in the galaxy, they eventually start losing these stars, and a lot of these stars start going their own ways across the galaxy. But trying to find and trying to track these stars is a bit of a challenge. And so first, the scientists identified several hundred less visible stars in this region, confirming that they indeed belong to the cluster in the past which already means that a lot of these stars left the cluster and are no longer connected to it. But generally, just like with galaxies, as clusters interact gravitationally with the center of the galaxy or other objects nearby, they usually also start producing what's known as a tidal tail, two tails on both sides, one being the leading tail and one being the trailing tail. And so something similar is expected to be found here as well. And naturally, by looking around, the scientists started to identify that indeed there were other stars in the tail that were in the vicinity as well. And a lot of these stars only started to become obvious as Gaia discovered more and more stars with relatively similar vectors of motion, with this now representing over a thousand light years of length. And so discovering these Hyades tails alone was already a pretty big achievement. But this wasn't the main achievement of the study, and this wasn't actually the most groundbreaking discovery here. And by the way, one of the reasons why the scientists were able to locate these stars is because they didn't limit their search to just some of the nearest objects. They decided to expand the search to some of the stars that might have left the cluster approximately 700 million years ago. Which means that a lot of these stars would have a pretty different motion and orbits across the galaxy. But by using an astronomical software known as AMUSE and by trying to combine it with various computer simulations, the scientists were able to build a predictive model of where other stars could be, the stars that came from this initial cluster about 700 million years ago while also being able to create a kind of a simulation of the last 650 million years of the evolution of this cluster, and how all of these stars spread across the galaxy. But then, by comparing these simulated stars with the actual observations from Gaia Telescope, 
they did discover some really major discrepancies, specifically with the trailing tail. That trailing tail was slightly stretched and was missing stars where there should have been some stars, as if something extremely massive, specifically here about 10 million masses of the Sun, passed through this region and disrupted the orbits of these stars. In other words, the observations suggested some kind of a massive object disrupting all of this, creating a kind of an unusual asymmetry that's visible in the tails today. So even though it should really look like this, it seems that whatever passed through this region made it kind of look like this instead. And that something was a chunk of something really massive, about twice as massive as the central black hole. And so that's really where the mystery begins, because right now, well, on the one hand we don't really know what it was, it definitely wasn't some sort of a black hole though, because it would have left a lot of other signs in its wake, but it still was something massive enough to pass through this matter and disrupt it just enough for us to notice. Oh, and by the way, something very similar was detected just a few years ago as well. There's at least one paper I discussed in one of the previous videos that talks about this in more detail. This was a discussion in regards to the detection of this unusual perturbation inside one of these stellar streams, which are these really large formations left by other galaxies around our own galaxy, and the perturbation suggested something that was just as massive passing through this region without any other signs. And so what exactly could it have been? Well, so far, the best possible explanation is the one that once again proves the existence and our speculations about dark matter. And in this case, this invisible cloud that we refer to as the dark matter halo that surrounds our galaxy and surrounds pretty much every other galaxy out there. And today a lot of scientists speculate that this dark matter halo that's around 1 million light years across is going to be made out of smaller chunks of what's known as a subhalos, nicely illustrated in this particular image as these relatively large chunks of something dark and something impossible to detect otherwise. But from what the scientists know or understand about dark matter, it doesn't seem to have any physical interaction with actual matter, only a gravitational interaction, so it can pass through a region such as a stream or a global cluster and have no effect other than disturb the orbital parameters of stars nearby. And this beautiful simulation from Dennis Erkel, whose study you can find in the description as well, shows us roughly what the scientists believe might happen to these various clusters. So the red chunks here are dark matter. As you can see, they don't really interact with stars, but they do gravitationally change things. And this is probably what happened to this particular cluster as well. And so one of these subhalo over densities, as they're known, passed through this region, it might have disrupted the global cluster and changed the orbital parameters for some of these stars, which when simulated indeed recreates the actual picture that we see with the Gaia telescope. And so that particular collision with this massive 10 million masses of the Sun dark matter subhalo right now is the most plausible explanation and once again is one of the best explanations for the existence of the mysterious massive dark matter. No other object that's massive enough is going to pass through this region without leaving some other unusual signs, such as for example huge amounts of energy released, or possibly even complete destruction of some of these stars. And so dark matter halo or dark matter subhalo, or basically a chunk of dark matter, right now is the best explanation. And since scientists have already seen other signs of this mysterious halo in other galaxies and have seen signs of potential mysterious massive dark matter, through gravitational lensing effects, there is really little reason to doubt that this is what happened. But once again, we still need to be careful and we still need to analyze more data, do a lot more observations and possibly find other solutions to this problem before this can be certainly stated as a fact. But it's still a really awesome discovery and of course once again confirms that Gaia telescope right now is one of the most important telescopes out there, doing some really incredible research by analyzing and by studying billions and billions of stars and other bright objects around us. But when it comes to Hyades cluster, well, I guess in some sense it's just the beginning. Once other scientists join in and start analyzing these stars, we might even discover something completely different, something even more groundbreaking, more mind-blowing. And I'm going to make sure to talk about this in one of the future videos. Hello wonderful person, this is Anton, and today we're going to be discussing yet another discovery coming from our own galaxy, the Milky Way, of another unusual structure that nobody knew existed until very recently. 
And this time the structure seems to be the first officially confirmed feather in one of the spiral arms of our galaxy. With a typical example of a feather galaxy being this one right here, NGC 2775. And you can sort of see it has all of these unusual structures all over the place that sort of resemble feathers. And what this new study suggests is that there is apparently one not so far away from where we located here in the solar system. So first of all, honestly when I originally saw this study, which as always you can find in the description below, I actually thought that they are talking about something that was recently discovered only a few months ago and this was just another way of naming this particular structure. I'm referring to the video from just a few months ago, which by the way should be popping up somewhere right there at some point, where the scientists essentially discovered what they referred to as the spiral arm break. An unusual formation inside one of the spiral arms not so far away from the solar system that was implied to be one of the potential feathers as well. Although in this case it really resembled what we usually refer to as a spur, a kind of a connection between two different spiral arms and it also had an extremely high angle, here it was about 60 degrees and it was going through the Sagittarius arm, this arm right here, with the sun being located in this region. But this recent study was surprisingly talking about a similar yet a completely different structure, one located in a region known as the Norma arm, so this arm right here, and that also seemed to possess a lot more wavy structures on the inside and also be a little bit larger in size, roughly around 6000 light years across. And so this of course is once again a somewhat surprising discovery, especially since it's only been a few months since the first discovery. Although I guess it's not really that surprising. And there's really a good reason for that that I mentioned in the previous video. For us living inside the galaxy, and so basically we're somewhere here, it's sort of difficult to visualize, to imagine and to study the structure of our own galaxy. We can only do so by first of all looking at some other galaxies, especially the ones that we think might resemble the Milky Way, and then by comparing what they have to what we see near us. And this way we can maybe start imagining what the Milky Way looks like. At the moment though it's really a lot of guesswork. For example NGC 2775 right here is also a spiral galaxy but it's what's known as the flocculent spiral galaxy. It doesn't really have very defined spiral arms and instead has a lot of these feathers everywhere. Whereas by looking at something like UGC 12158 we find a galaxy with very defined spiral arms and practically no feathers anywhere. And so trying to figure out which of these the Milky Way is has always been sort of the goal for a lot of astronomers. And typically in most astronomy books Milky Way is always presented as something like this. But it looks like this is maybe not the correct model. And it might resemble something more similar to this but with more defined spiral arms. Or I guess to be more exact the galaxy seems to possess at least one major feather. But chances are there are going to be more discovered in some of the future studies. So what exactly did the scientists discover in this recent study? So even though it's implied that it's some sort of a feather like in some of the other galaxies, the actual wording the scientists use is a sinusoidal wave. And they name this wave Gangotri wave, which is the name of the glacier that's responsible for providing pretty much all of the water in the biggest river in India, the Ganges river. With this being a pretty long wave as well, it's at least 6000 light years in length but possibly as long as 12,000 light years long. So it's actually one of the longest structures discovered in the last few years. It's also located about 15 to 17,000 light years away from the center of the galaxy. And if we were to combine the entire mass of this object, it would be around 9 million masses of the sun. That's basically about double the total mass of the central black hole. But why exactly did the scientists only discover this now? Well, one of the obvious reasons is because the gas that's actually all over the place in the central galaxy is sort of hiding a lot of this from our view. But at the same time it's really because of the type of gas that was studied in this particular study. They relied on the study of carbon monoxide. So they were actually tracing the motion of carbon monoxide in distant parts of our galaxy. And it just so happens that this object had just enough carbon monoxide on the inside to be easily traceable across vast distances of space, allowing the scientists to then map the structure. But naturally it's not made of carbon monoxide, it just has enough of it to be traceable. The vast majority of the mass of this object, like everything else in our galaxy, is made out of hydrogen. And so by using the surveys that were focusing on carbon monoxide, they were able to uncover this unusual formation. 
And just like the feathers in some of the other galaxies, this one also seems to connect to some of the other spiral arms as well. It sort of extends away from Norma, connecting with the other arms located very close to the center of the galaxy, and very likely forming connections with some other arms as well. And that's of course just an assumption based on what the scientists have seen in a lot of other galaxies. Normally, these feather formations do extend and connect a lot of arms and sort of act as these miniature bridges with a lot of gas traveling across these arms and thus allowing the gas to mix over time. And here it's also important for me to mention that overall, a lot of these spiral arms are not actually constant structures. They do constantly change and transform over time with a lot of stars going in and out as well as a lot of gas traveling across both the spiral arms and the space located between the arms themselves. So generally speaking, these types of feathers or these types of spurs are most likely used as basically bridges, with gas moving in and out of different arms and transferring from one place to another. And previous simulations from various studies involving these feathers from various galaxies discovered that a lot of these feathers form in certain types of galaxies when they have certain type of gas. For example, this study from 2006 discovered that the gas itself has to be relatively cold. It's only about 1000 Kelvin, which is extremely cold compared to the normal gas we find in the interstellar space, which is usually thousands and thousands of degrees. And so when gas is cold enough and when certain conditions are met, these feathers start to form naturally and connect various spiral arms. And also it's important to note that cold gas is also associated with the formation of stars. So it's quite possible that it's really star forming galaxies that generally form these unusual formations and thus allow a lot of gas that would produce stars to transport from one place to another. But that's of course just a speculation and our current understanding of all of these structures is extremely basic. As a matter of fact, the most recent study on these formations and the analysis of these formations, which as always you can find in the description below, determined that there is also a kind of a, what the scientists refer to as a wiggle instability that's usually responsible for forming some of these structures. So in other words, the spiral arms are just not stable enough and possibly have some other features in order to produce these unusual objects. And obviously their origin and of course their purpose at the moment is a big mystery to us. Or at least it's a big mystery to me. I mean, someone out there might have already solved the mystery, but I guess I just haven't found their paper yet. As a matter of fact, some studies or some astronomers have even looked here on planet Earth to try to find a solution to some of these problems. A spider web is actually one such potential solution. It seems that a lot of spiral galaxies, just like spider web, seem to form these spurs and a lot of similar formations just to sort of maintain the structure. But once again, speculation not currently known. And also, honestly, I'm just fascinated with spider webs, so I just wanted to show you this video. And you gotta admit, there's definitely some similarity between the spiral here and the spiral we have in a typical galaxy. Pretty cool similarity. But apart from that, well, that's pretty much it for this discovery. An interesting feather, somewhat unusual structure that a lot of scientists will be talking about in some of the future studies. For now though, a very preliminary discovery and a discovery that needs to be analyzed more. And considering that this is a second such structure discovered in the Milky Way in just the last few months, there's possibly a high chance that something similar to this might be discovered in some of the future studies in the next year or so, simply because of these new techniques used in these studies. Hello wonderful person, this is Anton and today we're going to be talking about new confirmations and also new analysis of the unusual structure within our own galaxy, within the Milky Way. The so-called warp of the Milky Way galaxy. With the warp itself being discovered not so long ago, but many different additional confirmations and different studies have now made it pretty clear that our galaxy is not actually flat after all. In some sense, it resembles a typical Pringles chip, which is very unusual but also mathematically makes a lot of sense. But in this video I wanted to also talk about what we've recently discovered and what we know about this warp so far. But first of all, it's somewhat difficult for us to see the shape of our own galaxy simply because of where we're located. We're inside the galaxy, so seeing the shape here is practically impossible. We can sort of try to imagine what all of this looks like by looking at certain distant stars, but without seeing the motion of these stars, it would be impossible for us to know what the galaxy really looks like. But in most scientific textbooks, and also in some sense in most high schools, we've always been taught that the galaxy is more or less flat. It sort of resembles this. 
And this is actually what the galaxy looks like in pretty much any computer simulation that I have as well. And here is one of the many examples of this simplified model of the Milky Way galaxy. From the side it looks completely flat. But in the last few years we've been making some major discoveries. One of the bigger discoveries from last year was the unusual formation known as the Radcliffe Wave. This unusual and really humongous formation is essentially a kind of a wave-like structure that many stars form around the Sun, with the Sun itself apparently traveling across the Radcliffe Wave as well. Now this is just one of the many signs of unusual deformations inside our own galaxy. More of these signs were discovered by the Polish scientists, who identified several major deformations inside the Milky Way by looking at different distant stars, as you can see in this particular image that they created. And interestingly, this is not unexpected. As a matter of fact, the majority of this galaxies we've seen out there are never really perfectly flat. The best example here is actually this beautiful warped galaxy known as UGC 3697. The warp within this galaxy has been studied quite thoroughly, and today we understand that it's most likely, just like so many other warps, created through some sort of a massive interaction with another object somewhere nearby, usually a relatively massive dwarf galaxy. A galaxy that's not powerful enough to absorb or to disrupt a galaxy, but that's still massive enough to dislodge a lot of these stars within the larger galaxy and to create a kind of a wave inside of it. Here's what this galaxy looks like if you were to look at it with a typical telescope. And so something similar most likely happened in the Milky Way galaxy. And today a lot of scientists, uh, at least in the past year or so, mostly came to the conclusion that it was probably caused by this very strange and somewhat mysterious galaxy known as Sagittarius Dwarf Galaxy. A galaxy that has a lot of influence on the Milky Way and potentially may have also influenced the formation of different stars in the Milky Way as well. Especially when it passes through the disk of the Milky Way, it has a tendency to dislodge a lot of gas, and this gas then sort of clumps together, forming new stars. There has been a speculation that this galaxy was possibly even responsible for the formation of our own Sun as well, essentially through the deformation of gas as it passes through the Milky Way galaxy. But every time it passes through the galaxy, it also deforms it, thus creating this unusual ripple that you see right here. But this is the older simulation, based on the older simulations and older studies analyzing this work. Today we actually have a lot more data from different telescopes, including some of the most incredible data coming out of Gaia Telescope, the telescope that's been instrumental in helping us develop an extremely accurate nearby map of all of the stars and all of the various types of objects moving across the night skies with extremely specific details of both their motion, their temperatures, and a lot of other star properties as well. But all of this data was also combined with Sloan Digital Sky Survey, and specifically the experiment known as Apache Point Observatory Galactic Evolution Experiment, also known as Apogee 2. And so by combining the data from Gaia Telescope with the data from SDSS, the scientists were able to create a really accurate three-dimensional map of, well, basically the nearby space and the galaxy itself. This allowed us to see how this warp moves across the night skies and most importantly allowed us to establish the overall size and the motion of this warp. Here's what all of this looks like. Now this might actually look a little bit fast, but notice how this is in millions of years. And interestingly, this also allowed the scientists in this paper to calculate that the warp moves across the galaxy every 440 million years. Let's actually make it a little bit slower here. So every 440 million years, the warp moves around Milky Way, which is roughly around the double amount of time it takes for the solar system to move across the galaxy. This means that the warp moves a little bit slower than a typical motion of the star, which also implies that the stars go through the warp most likely going up and down or possibly above and below the galactic plane and then return back to their normal motion when they leave the warp behind because the stars do seem to move faster than the warp. With one of the more unusual discoveries coming out of this new paper that you can find in the description below being in regards to the shape of this warp, it seems to be lopsided as the scientists refer to it, which implies that one of the sides here is a little bit more pronounced than the other side with one side experiencing something a little bit more dramatic than the opposite side. The scientists were also able to identify where this warp officially starts, and the distance from the center of the galaxy that they suggest is roughly around 27 to 28,000 light years away. 
Now, the current estimates for the distance to the galactic center from the solar system put us at around 25 to 26,000 light years, which also means that we are probably not really inside the warp, which also means that that Radcliffe I mentioned might be something entirely different and may have been created by some other phenomenon. Or it's possible that we just don't really understand how all of this stuff forms and we need to study these warps in more detail in order to learn what's happening here. The other unusual discovery here was that the younger stars seem to be more affected by this than the older stars. Stars that were 6 to 9 billion years old were not as warped or not as affected by this warp as the stars that were less than 3 billion years old. And here the scientists believe that it's something to do with the passage of the nearby dwarf galaxy, most likely Sagittarius dwarf galaxy, that did happen 3 billion years ago. But the exact reasons for this and the exact explanations for these differences are currently not really clear. Either way though, it does seem like Milky Way galaxy, like about 50 to 70% of all of the other disk galaxies, is indeed warped just like this one right here, maybe not to this extent though but still warped enough, as you can see in this simulation, to have a very pronounced upper edge and lower edge. Which isn't something that I guess most of us learned back in high school when we were learning about galaxies. Either way, a really interesting discovery, a very interesting analysis, and definitely something to look forward to once we discover how all of this happened and what all of this means for the future of our galaxy. Hello wonderful person, this is Anton, and in this video we're going to be talking about this unresolved mystery coming from the center of our own galaxy. The mystery of this strange glow that the scientists detected back in 2009, that still doesn't actually have a good explanation, but that some of the recent studies decided to investigate in a little bit more detail, trying to discover what it could be and also what it couldn't be. In the process also providing enough evidence, suggesting that this could technically be dark matter after all. Now, originally this unusual glow was discovered back in 2009 when the scientists using Fermi telescope, and this was when the Fermi telescope just started operating, decided to subtract all of the other possible glow visible here and try to see if they can discover something else unusual. And they found that even by removing pretty much most of the other light coming from the center, there was still this unusual excess of gamma ray radiation. And they refer to this as the galactic center gamma ray excess, or also known as galactic center giga electron volt excess. But nobody really knew exactly what it was, and Fermi telescope also started making a lot of other discoveries, so this wasn't really a priority anymore. With the biggest discovery of course being the Fermi bubbles, named after the telescope. But this didn't change the fact that there was still no good explanation to what exactly this was in the middle of the galaxy, producing approximately 2% more gamma radiation than should be produced coming from this region. So in other words, the success wasn't really that great, it was only 2%, but it was still significant enough that it needed an explanation. Although one of the first potential explanations did involve dark matter. And as a matter of fact, that's the explanation that most scientists kind of decided to go with. But by 2016, some scientists started to think that maybe it wasn't dark matter and a better explanation could be used here for one important reason. When some of the scientists analyzed the close-ups of those gamma ray emissions, they realized a lot of these gamma ray emissions, excess gamma ray emissions, were not really that smooth. They were more or less clumpy and seemed to have been distributed in a way that suggested these tiny objects in various locations across the central region with extremely energetic objects in the middle. And the most obvious explanation for the paper back then was basically that we're looking at hundreds and maybe even thousands of different pulsars, very powerful pulsars, that were producing a lot of gamma ray energy. So much as a matter of fact that, well, it would probably need its own explanation for why they were producing so much. But assuming that there are like a lot of them everywhere, specifically all located in the central region itself, it could potentially explain what we're observing here. But generally, because this region is so crowded and there are so many things going on, this was still not really a conclusive explanation because something else could have been happening here, something else that the scientists just don't really understand. And then there were obviously some other theories proposing that maybe this was just excessive energy from the black hole in the middle, maybe something else going on with the accretion disk and so on. So there were definitely a lot of ideas, but the best two explanations were still either a lot of pulsars or the dark matter, specifically dark matter made out of what we refer to as weakly interacting massive particles, also known as WIMPs, one of the explanations for what dark matter could be. And if one WIMP and one anti-WIMP 
suddenly collide with one another, just like all other particles and antiparticles, they produce a tremendous amount of energy, and in this case they would produce gamma rays. So this explanation still actually made quite a lot of sense. Oh, and the reason I'm showing you this beautiful photograph taken by Carl Anderson back in 1933, this is because this is actually the first ever photograph of the positron, the first picture of the antimatter ever observed. And what you're looking at here is a kind of a plate made out of lead that's meant to slow down the positron as it enters this location. And the positron itself is seen as this very unusual line that essentially is curving because there's also a lot of magnetic field here, which was applied to this particular plate simply to test various effects of positrons. Now in this particular case, what's interesting is that the curvature suddenly increases, and that's because it drops in the energy level as it passes through the plate itself. Either way though, this was essentially a visual proof of the existence of antimatter, and this was from back in 1933. So since then, obviously we've learned quite a lot about the idea of matter and antimatter. And so here, it is a pretty reasonable explanation that all of the success was from the annihilation of dark matter particles and dark matter antiparticles. And because certain scientists do believe that this is what's happening here, they wanted to investigate this in more detail by trying to find even more proof. And that's kind of what the scientists behind this paper that you can find in the description below decided to do. They took 11 years of data from the Fermi telescope, they then also compared this to data from some of the other telescopes, and then by making certain theoretical predictions, even took a look at 48 galaxies nearby, so so-called dwarf galaxies that are orbiting around the Milky Way galaxy, and tried to discover something similar in them as well. And so basically, so far, this was the one study that used the most possible data and with the most rigorous statistical analysis, providing the most detailed numerical explanation of what we're observing coming from this central region. For this, they even used one of the telescopes from the International Space Station, which collected data for the past few years. And well, in the end, what all of this suggests is that even though technically pulsars are still a possible explanation, currently dark matter seems to be a slightly better explanation, and they provide some evidence for this. And one of their main explanations here is in regards to the distribution of energy detected from these sources of gamma ray energy. So generally speaking, if this is coming from a typical matter or a typical pulsar emitting these gamma rays, we would actually expect a relatively large distribution of gamma ray energy with quite a lot of lower gamma rays and higher gamma rays coming from those particular sources. Yet if this is some sort of a dark matter particle annihilating when the particle and antiparticle collides, their energy is probably going to be relatively similar with the actual emissions ended up being more narrow in a much more specific frequency. And so despite the clumpiness of these sources, they do seem to emit energy that's much more narrow as if it was emitted by some sort of a particle antiparticle annihilation. And because a lot of this energy is concentrated specifically in the center of the galaxy, this also goes with all of the other dark matter theories that predict the highest concentration of dark matter right in the middle of a typical galaxy. So you would expect to have the highest concentration of the excess gamma rays coming from these regions. However, the thing is, when they looked at other galaxies nearby, and here we're just talking about dwarf galaxies located close to the Milky Way galaxy, they did not find any excess gamma rays here. However, according to the scientists, this non-detection actually just means that we can now narrow down the energy levels for those particles and antiparticles, and even providing the approximate value for the total energy this particle would have. But with the energy coming from our own galaxy, fitting pretty nicely with the predictions of what a typical dark matter annihilation would create. And so this is a somewhat interesting and somewhat um, unsatisfactory discovery, I guess. On the one hand, it does suggest that this unusual glow could still be definitely dark matter or definitely a lot of pulsars. But the data from the study does actually imply that whatever is causing this is an extremely specific particle of a very specific energy level. A particle that could hypothetically be dark matter, but could also be something entirely different. And moreover, because no such detections were found from nearby dwarf galaxies, this also makes this somewhat unusual because we do expect these uh, galaxies to have a lot of dark matter in them as well. But because they're not emitting similar gamma ray radiation, either they have their own levels of particles in them, or a more likely explanation here is that, well, that there is really no good explanation here, that it's still a really, really big mystery, and nobody is actually certain what exactly is causing this unusual glow this excess glow of gamma rays coming from the center of the Milky Way galaxy, but not from the nearby galaxies. 
Or I guess the mystery is still as mysterious as it was back in 2009 when it was originally found. But can we actually solve this anytime soon? Well, probably not. Mostly because, at this point, some other angle has to be taken, some other considerations have to be made in order to figure out what's really happening here. The amount of data analyzed in the study is actually tremendous, and the statistical approach taken here is also quite rigorous as well. And so even though the implication from this study is that it's maybe dark matter or some sort of an energetic particle, in reality there's just no good explanation. And so, in some sense, we're back to square one. We still have no idea what's going on, and it's just another mystery to add to the list of mysteries of the universe. Once in a while, scientists discover something really incredible about our own galaxy, something that helps us understand how things here operate and how things move around. And sometimes these new discoveries help us answer questions that we couldn't really answer before. Hello wonderful person, today we're going to be talking about one such discovery. A discovery that connects one of the features in our galaxies with one of the mysterious stellar streams that has been traveling around the galaxy in the last few billion years. The stream known as the Hercules stream. And what this discovery potentially suggests is that something mysterious, very likely dark matter, which we don't really understand very well just yet, is causing the galaxy to slow down over time and is also causing some of the stars to leave to the outskirts. Which is actually something that a lot of different theories predicted before, but has never really been proved observationally. And so now we have this proof. But first of all, well, let's start in the middle of our own galaxy. If we look at the Milky Way from, I guess, the top in this case, we would actually discover a shape known as the bar, specifically a galactic bar. It's not very easy to see at first, and it's also very difficult to see in all galaxies, but it very likely looks something like this from the top. We are located somewhere right here, and the bar itself is sort of going across this way. And it also connects to the two major arms of our galaxy. Now this is of course a pure speculation at the moment because we can't really see the galaxy from the top, but it's based on the investigations of star motion and also is based on pictures of other similar spiral galaxies we have from the outside. For example, this is NGC 1300 with an extremely beautiful galactic bar you can see right here. And there are quite a lot of other examples, such as NGC 4921, NGC 1073, or this right here, NGC 1365. As a matter of fact, about two-thirds of all spiral galaxies seem to have these bars, and the scientists have even established that it's a feature that seems to appear in older, more established galaxies. And so, for example, when the scientists look at some of the ancient galaxies in distant universe, only about 20% of all of them will contain bars. But when we look at more recent times, about 65% of galaxies contain them. It implies that these uh, features established over time. Also, many of these galaxies, such as M83 right here, will also often contain a very active galactic nucleus in the middle. Or basically, they'll have an active black hole producing a lot of radiation and a lot of emissions at all times. Which also, of course, implies that the Milky Way galaxy was such a galaxy in the past. We do have signs of this all over the place. These features also usually act as a kind of a stellar nursery, producing a lot of new stars, which then sort of travel across the galaxy and spread pretty much all over the place as well. But the actual formation process of these bars is not entirely well understood. It's something to do with the density wave coming from the center, but is still being debated even today. What's not being debated is the fact that these galactic bars play a really large role in, well, basically controlling the motions of things in the galaxy. Because this represents such a huge massive object, it will usually affect a lot of motion of stars and a lot of interstellar gas that orbits around the galaxy. And many of these stars, especially the ones right here, will often become basically locked to this bar, or essentially become gravitationally linked to it in a very similar manner to how Jupiter that you see right here will actually lock some of the asteroids gravitationally, creating what's known as centaurs. And so generally speaking, we expect a lot of stars to form a kind of a bar and to kind of spin in such a way that the bar will maintain its shape over time, billions of years actually. But all of these gravitationally linked stars, or the stars in resonance with this bar, will also start experiencing any kind of effect that the bar experiences. So, for example, if suddenly this bar starts to slow down and to basically start moving a little bit slower, the resonance from the bar itself will obviously start affecting the stars as well. Another way of looking at this 
is to once again take a look at the Trojans of Jupiter. So if suddenly I were to take Jupiter and to slowly start decreasing its speed, which will take its orbit farther and farther away from the Sun because now it's moving a little bit slower, eventually all of these Trojans that were connected to Jupiter will also, because of the resonance, start moving to the outskirts of the solar system and assume new resonance there. Meaning that if the central bar starts slowing down, the stars that were connected to it through resonance will also start moving to the outskirts of the galaxy. At least that's what a lot of theories have predicted in the past. But how can we possibly prove this and is there any actual evidence out there? Well, one way to prove this is to find stars that did come from the inner regions of the galaxy and that are maybe connected through resonance to the galactic bar. And it looks like we might have actually found them. So first of all, there are a lot of these galactic streams around the Milky Way galaxy. This image here sort of illustrates some of them. Now, most of them are produced through, well, basically leftovers from galactic collisions. Some of them are produced in other ways. Some of them are still mysterious. But at least one of them, called Hercules Stream, involves a bunch of stars moving across the galaxy not so far away from us, but with a relatively similar speed to each other, however, a speed that's different from everything else around them. All of these stars in a Hercules stream are moving about 40 kilometers per second slower than the stars near them. Okay, so for example, if we look at this picture and we look at our own sun, we know that the sun is moving around the galaxy at a relative speed of about 230 kilometers per second. But these stars in the Hercules stream are moving slower. So here, I guess it would be about 190 kilometers per second. And for the most part, they all sort of connected to one another. But it just so happens that the scientists behind the recent paper discovered that they're also connected to something else. And you probably guessed what it is. They're all connected to the central galactic bar of the Milky Way galaxy. They're basically moving in resonance with the galactic bar. Which kind of implies that they probably came from the galactic bar a long time ago. But that's just the first piece of evidence. The scientists then also compared the metallicity of these stars, or basically how much of various materials they have on the inside, with the overall metallicity of other stars in the center of the galaxy compared to the stars near us. Now, generally, when it comes to metallicity, in some of the past studies, the scientists have discovered that there is actually a kind of a gradient in a typical galaxy, including, of course, the Milky Way. And so, generally speaking, as you move away from the center of the galaxy, the average metallicity of the stars will decrease. Whereas, if you move within the approximately 10 to 15,000 light years away from the center, the metallicity there will start increasing. And the closer to the center you get, the more metallicity we can sort of expect. With some obvious exceptions, including things like, for example, global clusters, which will usually have low metallicity. But the general idea here is that by looking at the average metallicity of stars in, for example, a typical cluster, or in this case, a galactic stream, such as the Hercules stream, we can then sort of figure out what part of the galaxy this stream or these stars might have come from. For example, if we find a star that's very similar in metallicity to our sun, it probably came from the region around here, about 25,000 light years away from the center of the galaxy. If we find something much lower in metallicity, it probably came from slightly farther away. If it's something higher in metallicity, it probably came from a little bit closer to the center. Well, it turns out that the metallicity of the stars in the Hercules stream do suggest that they actually came from much, much deeper inside the galaxy. Or in other words, that they actually traveled to the outskirts. And so the motion of the stars from inside the galaxy to the outside, plus the fact that they're connected gravitationally through resonance with the galactic bar, both of these facts do suggest that, well, the galactic bar very likely slowed down over time. As a matter of fact, the calculations suggest that it slowed down by about 24% since the original creation, which also means that the galaxy sort of slowed down its rotation as well. It spins about 24 times slower now than it used to spin in the beginning. And theoretically speaking, there is really only one explanation to how this is possible. It's only possible if our galaxy is literally inside some sort of a large galactic halo of dark matter. Something very massive, something very invisible, something that makes our galaxy slowly slow down. Basically slowly slowing things down as the things spin inside of it. And unfortunately, that's not really good news for alternative theories. If this is true, if the galaxy indeed slowed down, there is really no other explanation available to us. No other theory provides enough answers to show us how a galaxy can slow down so quickly over time. But the theories invoking dark matter explaining the universe 
explain all of this really well. As a matter of fact, they provide a very direct evidence that something is definitely slowing down the galaxy and that something is massive enough to also explain a lot of other observations. That massive thing, phenomenon, whatever you want to call it, is dark matter. Although nobody still knows what exactly it is, we just seem to be observing the effects, not really the actual, I guess, particle or whatever it is responsible for the effects. Which is why I generally prefer to call this anomalous mass phenomenon. It's some sort of a mass, it's some sort of anomaly, and it's a thing, it's an event, it's a phenomenon, but possibly not a particle. But still, a really cool study, amazing evidence, and most importantly, provides a lot of evidence for a lot of mysteries, including the mysteries of the Hercules stream, and helps us understand how the actual galactic bars transform over time. Although naturally, a study like this will probably also create some questions, and that means that we're going to be talking about this in some of the future videos as well. Hello on the person, this is Anton, and today we're going to be talking about yet another incredible discovery coming from the center of the Milky Way, from the center of our own galaxy. And this time, it's based on the observations from the incredible Chandra X-ray observatory, the images from which the scientists were able to stitch together and discover what the center sort of looks like. And this is really important because, generally speaking, because the center of the Milky Way is relatively active and there is a lot of gas everywhere, we normally don't really get to see any details coming from this region. From our perspective, most of it sort of looks like this, and so trying to tell apart what's happening here or learning any details requires a lot of very specific observations using specific frequencies of light. So in optical light, in light that our eyes can see, we cannot actually see anything. But once we look at the universe in the X-rays, and start looking at the center of the galaxy in that particular frequency of light, we start seeing a little bit more detail. And this is what NASA's Chandra usually does really well. But we can also see some other details by using radio frequencies as well, which allow us to penetrate a lot of the invisible parts of the galaxy and the universe as well. And so by combining the radio emissions with X-ray emissions and then by stitching everything together into a relatively large and extremely precise panorama, Here's what the scientists were able to produce. Now this is a pretty large image, but right here you're about to see what the center of the galaxy looks like in X-ray and in radio light. So somewhere right here at the center of the galaxy, that's where we expect the supermassive black hole to be. But as you can kind of see, there are a lot of other details and a lot of other unusual formations that seem to have been identified in this recent image and this recent study that you can find in the description below. But first, let's actually identify some of these features and some of these um, structures. So the Sagittarius A star is in this region, and as you can see, the scientists in this paper pointed out some of the other interesting features. The ones we're going to be discussing more in this video are these unusual filamental formations that you see marked with red rectangles. This one in particular is actually extremely interesting, and if we were to zoom in here, we would see something that looks like this. Now, by itself, this is already a really mysterious, very unusual, and to some extent previously unseen structure. But I'll tell you in a few minutes what exactly we think this is. First of all, what exactly is this showing us? Well, it's literally showing us the galactic weather. It's basically whatever happens in the center of the galaxy when a lot of different interaction occurs because of the magnetic um, interaction, because of the activity from the central black hole, because of various supernova, various stars being created and exploding, and a lot of different activity all happening all at the same time. This is literally what we usually observe around our sun as well, except here things happen much faster because the sun is obviously much smaller. This type of a galactic weather is to some extent very similar to the solar weather, and the effects and thus the actual interaction is also extremely similar. But because things here are really, really large, we're talking about hundreds and sometimes even thousands of light years in size, everything here is much, much slower. And right now, this is definitely the clearest and the most detailed picture we've ever had of the center of the galaxy, and because of the X-ray and radio observations, all of this dust kind of disappeared from the view. So this is what you would see if you were to remove this whole thick layer of dust and gas that's sort of blocking the view of the center. Now, one of the unusual discoveries here, or in some sense confirmations of something, was the discovery of a relatively large bubble of gas, specifically magnetized plasma gas, 
that extends down or south of the galactic core and is roughly around 700 light years in size. And this is based on another study I discussed a couple of years ago when back in 2019 the scientists discovered that there was an unusual formation, bubble-like formation that suggested some sort of a large eruption that happened from the center of the galaxy. This was detected in radio emissions and so this of course suggested that our black hole in the center very likely produced a really large eruption sometime in the past. And all of this is probably directly related to the so-called Fermi bubbles you see right here, which are much, much larger in size, but do seem to represent some kind of a similar event that was probably a lot more powerful and happened sometime in the past, even further in the past, possibly a few million years ago. And so this, of course, does imply that the galactic center of our own galaxy is occasionally active and produces these very large emissions. These images also show us very large amounts of gas outflowing all over the place, and most of this gas is very likely produced by a tremendous amount of different supernova happening all over the place. With each of these supernova sort of acting like bubbles that pop, create a lot of energy, a lot of pressure, and spread things around, while at the same time also producing a lot of other effects we still don't really understand. But a lot of this gas is also very highly magnetized, and because it's basically plasma moving around and creating a lot of different interaction with other plasma, this of course results in the formation of tremendously large and very powerful magnetic lines. This is the image of the center of our galaxy taken by the NASA's SOFIA telescope, which sort of shows us these magnetic lines moving through the entire galaxy all over the place. And one thing we know as a fact about magnetic lines, and that's from observing our sun and also from observing planets, is that they do have a tendency to reconnect. And this magnetic reconnection seems to happen all over the place. Now, we know that, for example, this is how our sun sort of expels a lot of material, which we usually refer to as the coronal mass ejection. These powerful ejections are so powerful, as a matter of fact, that they can easily disturb a lot of electronics and electric activity on our own planet. At the same time, this is how a lot of planets like Venus lose their atmosphere. Through various magnetic reconnections, they actually create these tiny bubbles of atmosphere that ends up escaping into outer space. But it looks like something very similar happens on galactic scales as well. Because those two rectangles I showed you before were pointing at these things right here. And this seems to be the result of a magnetic reconnection of galactic scales. Both of these features right here are perpendicular to the plane of the galaxy and also relatively similar in size and in structure. They're both approximately 20 light years in length and about 0.2 light years in thickness. And from what the scientists think happened here was very similar to what happens around our sun. Magnetic lines reconnected and created these formations which are also sending out a lot of material and a lot of energy throughout the inner regions of the galaxy. And this is exactly what the scientists think kind of mixes and creates a lot of different interaction on the inside. These events probably play a very important role in helping the gas move around the intergalactic medium and also possibly create new stars as well as a lot of this material moves around and as a lot of these large molecular clouds start colliding into one another. These also create a lot of energy and they also end up heating up a lot of gas. So they're responsible for a lot of different things happening in the center of the galaxy. Which literally shows us a previously unknown mechanism that definitely helps galaxies and uh, galactic structures to evolve, to become larger, to become more powerful, and to mix a lot of materials on the inside, possibly then sending it to the outside. And so the scientists currently are pretty sure that this is a completely new phenomenon nobody ever knew about before, and nobody really studied in detail. So expect a lot of studies about these unusual filaments in the future. They don't really have a name yet, they're just referred to as X-ray threads with a name starting with the letter G. I'm sure a cool name will probably follow in the next few months. But I guess it's really interesting how it looks like a lot of things in the universe do have very similar events and similar features happening on small scales and on larger scales. We know that magnetic interaction happens on planetary scales and there are a lot of different magnetic reconnections even around planet Earth. We also know about magnetic reconnection around the Sun and other stars and now it looks like it also happens on galactic scales. For all we know, it happens on even larger scales, possibly with galactic clusters. Something that a lot of scientists will probably be investigating and studying because there are definitely a lot of features 
and a lot of previous studies that have hinted on this as well. But what exactly does this do to regulate the galaxy and how exactly it affects the galaxy, none of these questions we can currently answer. For example, nobody knows how much energy is produced during these events, what exactly is being transported by these magnetic reconnections, and how this affects the evolution of the galactic center, or if it's actually even important for the galactic center. Does this happen around other galaxies? Other galaxies where it doesn't happen? And if so, why doesn't it happen there? So quite a lot of questions, not a lot of answers. More importantly though, this is sort of one of the possible answers for the mysterious cosmic rays we've been detecting, about which there's actually going to be another video or possibly have already come out. It's a video that talks about the unusual super powerful cosmic rays, sometimes referred to as the pentavolt rays, that seem to be too powerful to be produced by anything, but they could be coming and could be created by these unusually strong magnetic reconnection events coming from the center of the galaxy. So maybe this is actually a solution to one of the mysteries we currently have. But for now it's really early to tell. In some of the future videos we'll come back and talk more about these, especially once they get a cool name or when we discover something else about them. Until then, well it's definitely a really cool image, a really mysterious object, there's unfortunately not much we know about them just yet. Hello wonderful person, this is Anton, and today we're going to be discussing some new discoveries in regards to our own galaxy, the Milky Way, and more specifically, the morphology or the shape of the Milky Way. Because once again, something was discovered about the Milky Way, suggesting that our original perception of what Milky Way might look like might have been a little bit incorrect. Okay, what do I mean by that? Well, if you were to Google Milky Way, you'll see something that looks like this. This is what our stereotype of the Milky Way is right now. But because we're basically looking at the galaxy from the inside, it's practically impossible for us to visualize this, because all we're seeing is this. And so identifying the actual shape of our galaxy has been actually a priority for many decades now. But it's still very, very difficult. But thanks to some of the new advances in telescope technology, and more specifically, a really one single mission, the ESA's or European Space Agency's Gaia telescope has been accurately mapping the distance to various stars for a few years now. More and more studies started to come out, allowing us to calculate distances to various objects extremely precisely, and thus start to create various three-dimensional maps, working out certain structures in the galaxy itself. And because of these advances coming from the Gaia telescope, that's why essentially we were able to discover so many new features of the Milky Way galaxy in the last few years. And this year alone there have been a lot of different videos, or a lot of different topics that I've covered, essentially helping us realize that the Milky Way is a little bit different from what we imagined. A lot of these videos are going to be popping up somewhere right there at some point. And so anyway, so now we have some more discoveries, and a few more discoveries suggesting something else that we didn't really realize about the Milky Way. And this first discovery comes from the region away from the center of the galaxy. The region that's usually referred to as the galactic anti-center. So basically, if we're here and this is the center, now we're talking about what's on the other side in the dimmer regions on the outskirts of the galaxy itself. The edge of the galaxy, if you want to refer to it that way. And here's sort of what this region looks like. But it's always been somewhat difficult to study this region because, well, we're basically inside the disk of the galaxy and there's a lot of dust here. This entire region of the so-called galactic midplane, where we're also located right now as well, generally has a tremendous amount of dust all over the place that also interferes with a lot of different observations, especially away from the center of the galaxy. But it's not because it's like fog hiding stars, for example. It's actually because the dust in front of the stars ends up interfering with the emissions from the stars and makes it extremely difficult to calculate the exact parameters of those stars. For example, if we want to discover the certain distance to a star, we really have to get the direct light from it. But if there's dust in between us, the calculations in this case become a lot less accurate. And because of this, it's always been difficult to study this region. But a lot of theoretical studies predicted the existence of various types of small filamental structures, to some extent maybe somewhat similar to the ones you see right here, although these are produced by magnetic fields, that could potentially exist in the outer disk of the Milky Way and formed through the interaction with various satellite galaxies that would either collide or possibly even get absorbed by the Milky Way through billions of years of interaction. 
But some of the more extreme versions of this usually referred to as the stellar streams. A lot of these have been discovered in the past and a lot of them seem to be connected with ancient dwarf galaxies that either got absorbed or somehow interacted with the Milky Way. But the theoretical calculations also suggested smaller such structures on the outskirts at the edges of the Milky Way from the interactions with various small galaxies. Yet interestingly, this new analysis revealed something the scientists did not expect. It revealed a tremendous number of these structures, way, way more than they expected, with just some of them visible right here as these lines you see on the screen. And the existence of these very, very large filamentary disk structures that seem to be present all over the mid-plane of our galaxy, at least in these numbers, is currently very difficult to explain. For example, here there seem to be seven of them, with this, by the way, being the Large Magellanic Cloud and the Small Magellanic Cloud. This right here is the bridge connecting them. And this large formation represents Sagittarius Dwarf Galaxy that we've discussed in some of the previous videos that's currently being broken apart by our own galaxy. Either way though, just the number of these formations is kind of difficult to explain, but it probably does have something to do with some of the other galaxies being broken apart by the Milky Way as well. With one explanation suggesting that maybe these are just tidal arms from various interaction between the Milky Way's disk and various satellite galaxies that somehow disturbed it one way or another. Since there are so many different satellite galaxies the Milky Way has, close to about 50, it's sort of expected that a lot of them will create some kind of a deformation in the disk. But as we've discussed in one of the previous videos, a lot of these galaxies have never actually been in this vicinity, so many of them have never interacted with the Milky Way. Which means that maybe this was created by some of the other galaxies that used to exist and were eventually absorbed by the Milky Way itself. And some of the previous investigations of similar streams that were detected a few years ago suggested that many of these stars are extremely old. They're basically over 8 billion years old. This means, of course, that a lot of this interaction probably happened a long, long time ago. Or maybe all of this is somehow related to the discovery from a few years ago that suggested that our galaxy is somewhat warped and has these unusual formations at the outskirts, which could then create these very large distortions at the edge of the galaxy, which we're now observing as these unusual formations or these unusual filaments. In other words, it's currently anyone's guess. What is clear, however, at least from these studies, is that the edge of our galaxy is far from being quiet. It seems to indicate a lot of exciting activity, a lot of different types of impacts, a lot of different kicking around, and a lot of different types of mixing of materials, which potentially created all sorts of different filaments. And so if I were to use my very poor Photoshop skills to try to illustrate this using this Milky Way image, instead of being very orderly and very even as you see it here, it's probably full of different disturbances, all sorts of unusual filaments, all sorts of unusual spiky formations. With all of this being a sign of billions of years of interaction between various satellite galaxies and the Milky Way. Okay, that's probably not what it looks like, but I tried my best. But that's just one of these discoveries about the edge of the galaxy. There was another discovery also around the same time, and also from the same data, but this time about one of the galactic arms of the Milky Way that's actually one of the most well-studied arms to begin with. The Perseus arm you see right here, with the Sun itself being located in this region. And once again, if we actually look at our current understanding of the Milky Way galaxy, the way we think it looks, it might possess these very orderly, very nicely shaped arms, with basically this being the stereotypical image from a typical textbook. But because we didn't really have Gaia telescope data up until recently, nobody really knew how well structured and how orderly all of this appeared from a distance, or, or basically if you were to look at our galaxy from the top. And interestingly, for this study, the scientists decided to rely on a combination of Gaia telescope data and all of that dust that I previously mentioned. The observations from the dust actually helped the scientists discover what all of this looks like. And in this case, by creating a 3D map of dust located in a certain part of the galaxy, we can generally use this to examine large collection of stars and where these stars are located. And so by using three-dimensional gas maps created by another team, and combining this with new observations of various molecular clouds that are usually connected to these dust clouds, the scientists were able to work out the actual shape of Perseus' galactic arm which then allowed them to create a three-dimensional reconstruction of what the entire arm might sort of look like. 
And although all of the previous work suggested the arm was very well defined and had a very specific structure, this study presented a completely different image. All of the gas that was previously believed to be located in the same region was actually much much farther away from one another, suggesting of course that the arm might actually be just an illusion or it at least does not have a very distinct and very narrow shape. The authors refer to this as a clumpy chaotic formation. And in this case, a lot of this material seems to stretch at a distance of about 10,000 light years, even though it was believed to be in a relatively similar region of space. Which to scientists behind this paper suggests that, well maybe at least this region of the galaxy, although possibly even other regions, seem to resemble another galaxy we're very familiar with. The galaxy known as M83 or Massey 83 that possesses arms that do have a lot of breaks, a lot of irregular shapes in them, and overall seems to be extremely mysterious as well, because a lot of these formations also present a lot of different types of activity. A big number of supernova, a big number of different star formation regions, but it also seems to contain a double nucleus in the center, which to some extent might explain why these arms are not as defined. Although at the moment, because this is just a completely brand new discovery, nobody really has any idea what's going on and why Perseus' arm seems to be so disorganized and so chaotic. And so for all we know, maybe some of the arms are disorganized, but other ones might be more structured. And so if I get back to my Photoshop skills here, we now also have to sort of destroy or disassemble the Perseus arm with my new Milky Way version resembling something like this. Definitely more of a Picasso here than um, Rembrandt. Anyway, I'm just bad at art. So what all of these studies suggest to us is that, well, we still are basically learning about the morphology of the Milky Way and the last five years and a lot of different studies using Gaia Telescope have been absolutely instrumental in discovering the true image of our galaxy. It does not seem to be this simple shape. It doesn't seem to be so organized and so well defined. It clearly contains a lot of filaments and a lot of disorganization on the inside and also some of its arms might not be well defined. And then maybe there's something like this and there's something like this and this can be just a big smiley face. Hello wonderful person, this is Anton and today we're going to be talking about the most mysterious, most hazardous, most violent region in the galaxy. We're going to be talking about the center of the galaxy or the central molecular zone as it's also known, sometimes referred to as the central galactic area. This is also the place where you can find the mysterious Sagittarius A star, the supermassive black hole in the middle of our own galaxy. And today I wanted to discuss some of the new discoveries coming from this area, some of the mysteries of this area, and also just generally what we're expecting to discover here if one day we make it there. And that's a big if, by the way. Anyway, so what exactly is this? It's actually an area contained inside of the larger part of the galaxy that we often refer to as the galactic bulge. But unlike the bulge that's usually symmetrical, the central galactic area or the central molecular zone is not. It's extended in one direction more than the other by almost 300 light years. Which by the way is one of the mysteries. Nobody really knows why exactly it sort of shifted to one side. It's very likely due to possible collisions from other galaxies or interactions with dwarf galaxies around us, but it's still not very clear. What we do know about this area though, based on the observations from various telescopes in various types of light, such as this beautiful infrared image, is that this is a really massive area. It contains roughly around 60 million masses of the sun, and that's actually about 15 times more than the black hole in the middle, and altogether this represents a really large chunk of the mass in this particular region. And on the other hand, a lot of the regions here are filled with different materials. They are filled with molecules that we normally expect inside molecular clouds or clouds that are usually responsible for creating new stars. They're also filled with a lot of really hot gas, or relatively hot gas, with average temperature here being roughly around 100 degrees Kelvin, with certain regions being about 500 Kelvin. And that means that these regions are sort of expected to produce a tremendous amount of stars and obviously planets. These regions are extremely similar to typical molecular clouds that normally result in the formation of stars. But based on various observations for years now, scientists have always been kind of puzzled by the fact that we don't see a lot of star production here. As a matter of fact, the total star production in this area 
is sort of believed to be about 0.1 masses of the Sun, which is basically this tiny piece you see right next to the actual Sun. Which means that some stars are definitely produced, but not nearly as many as we would expect. And because this region contains so many different molecular clouds, and also different clumps of gas that usually results in the production of basically stars in other parts of the galaxy, this is one of the biggest mysteries. How come so few stars are actually born here? Something must be disrupting them, or something must be happening here that we don't really understand, preventing stars from forming. And to try to explain this better, basically here is where the sun is. The total amount of gas, the gas density, the temperature of gas here, is so much lower than the gas and the density present in the middle of the galactic center. On top of this, the amount of radiation and various types of very powerful emissions coming from this region do suggest that a lot of activity is happening here, kind of similar to a typical molecular cluster. Very similar in this way to a typical molecular cloud that normally then results in a production of lots of different stars and some sort of a star cluster. These regions also contain a lot more pressure, a lot more turbulence, a lot more magnetic effects, all of which suggest that stars should be popping up here and there all over the galactic center, yet they don't. And they don't by a factor of like a hundred. We expect at least a hundred more stars being formed there than we see in reality. And so to try to confirm all of this and to try to analyze all of this, the scientists decided to take a very thorough look at this region once again and study it with some of the most advanced telescopes that we have today. With the study itself and all of the relevant data as always in the description below. And just like before, there was definitely a confirmation that we see a lot of different supernova remnants. We also see lots of different molecules like carbon monoxide, things like hydrogen cyanide, silicon monoxide, and lots and lots of different emission nebula that produce a tremendous amount of radiation. Once again confirming that the central galactic region is just extremely powerful and has a lot of activity at all times. This is probably one of the most violent places in the galaxy as a matter of fact and it stayed that way for billions and billions of years. But by using more advanced telescopes, the scientists now were able to actually see the potential regions where stars could be forming. In other words, here the telescopes allow them to see potential star forming regions, but not really something we would call a protoplanetary disk or something we would call a baby star. So definitely not something like this. In other words, stars were not really forming, but the potential for forming those stars was still there. So they were definitely seeing the supernova remnant, they were also definitely seeing the shapes equivalent to star forming regions pretty much everywhere, but none of them were producing these shapes. None of them were actually ending up as disks. And why exactly this is not happening is not really a question we know how to answer yet. Now obviously to produce such a disk and to produce a star and thus planets, a molecular cloud has to go through various types of activities for approximately a million years. This usually takes almost a million years to produce. But whatever is happening in the galactic center might somehow disrupt these molecular clouds from forming the disks and because a lot of things can happen in the center of the galaxy in roughly around a million years, there is currently no one good explanation for what's causing stars not to form. But by looking all across this galactic center, they definitely identified several hundred different areas that should potentially produce stars, and thus planets. According to the scientists, they've identified approximately 285 definitive targets, and then also possibly about 500 potential targets in this data. With the estimates suggesting that this particular area should be producing up to about 2.2 masses of the sun per year in terms of the actual star formation. And by the way, our galaxy in total produces only about one and a half masses of the sun. So that technically means that the center itself has the potential for producing a lot of different stars. But it's not doing that and the actual number is about 20 times less. Only about 0.1 masses of the sun is used for star production. And remember, this area is perfect for formation of stars. It's very similar to, for example, the Orion Nebula, where a lot of stars are being formed as well. Just like the Orion Nebula, the pressures and the temperatures and even the amount of energy released is extremely similar, yet the number of stars is much smaller. Which in some sense leaves us with a mystery. Nobody knows why the star formation is about 20 times less than it should be. 
It could be obviously because of effects from some sort of a tidal disruption by the black hole, but here we're talking about distances of thousands of light years, so it really shouldn't affect that much. It can also be because of the overall turbulence of the area, maybe it just disrupts the clouds before they can form into larger clumps, but that's not entirely clear from these observations. Which also brings us to the other potential resolution, we might just not really understand how stars form to begin with. Or basically maybe we're just missing some crucial step in how a cloud becomes this. And that particular step that's necessary for star formation is maybe what's not happening inside the central region. What that step is, right now nobody really knows. But maybe one day we'll discover what's happening there and maybe one day we'll be able to understand why the most violent region in the galaxy is so devoid of new stars. Although the answer is probably not aliens. Nevertheless, this is a super interesting region for us to study, especially because as scientists mentioned in the paper, this region resembles a typical young galaxy. This is basically what a lot of young galaxies may have looked like when all of the stuff was circulating and being extremely violent, extremely turbulent, and a lot of different activity was going on everywhere when the galaxy was still young and forming a lot of stars everywhere. But once again, there's that discrepancy with the star formation. And so I guess we'll have to leave it at that. The mystery from the central galaxy, from the central molecular cloud, where something is stopping stars from turning into stars, and from obviously creating planets along with those stars as well. Hello wonderful person, this is Anton, and today we're going to be talking about another interesting discovery that was made by citizen scientists. Essentially amateur scientists working on a project known as the Milky Way project, whose main purpose was to try to catalog and analyze a lot of different stars in the Milky Way galaxy. And over the years, the citizen scientists once again discovered something that no one else knew existed. Something that the scientists currently refer to as YBs, or yellow balls. And in this video, I wanted to briefly talk about what this is and what some of the recent studies discovered. But first of all, where exactly does all of this come from and what exactly are these citizen science projects? Now, back in the days, I think possibly about four to five years ago, I've actually tried to pitch a few of them because I was actually participating in a lot of these projects as well, with one of these older projects being the Milky Way project. But if astronomy is not really your thing and if you actually want to participate in a project that's maybe in a different field, there are literally hundreds and hundreds of projects you could technically join. And so here we have projects in arts, climate, history, language, and a lot, a lot more. All of this part of a brilliant website known as Zooniverse, the link for which you can find in the description, that essentially has the kind of a community between the scientists needing help and the citizen scientists providing the help. Now, normally the way this works, and here, let's actually just jump into one so I can show it to you. So let's uh, see what this Iberian Camera Trap project is. You basically go through a very brief training where it kind of shows you what the scientists are looking for. And your goal is then to go through various slides or various pictures and to try to identify things in them using a kind of a mini game. So for example, right here, we see that the camera captured something. I personally don't think I know what this is, but there are some examples that are already given to us and uh, we basically just have to click on this. Now, I think if I zoom in, it sort of looks like a pig or some sort of a pig-like creature. So I'm just going to go for a wild boar. And once you're done with one picture, it shows you the next one. And depending on your interest or what sort of scientist you want to help, there's also usually a forum you can join where a lot of people are generally discussing the ideas, discussing their discoveries or asking questions. But one of these projects that originally started back in 2012 was the Milky Way project. The purpose of the original project was to try to identify various somewhat massive stars located in the Milky Way galaxy and essentially helping uh, citizen scientists to mark them and to identify them for further analysis, especially if they were particularly massive. But as the citizen scientists started working on them, several forum posts started noticing something unusual, something that they really didn't understand. In a lot of these observations of various stars out there, the citizen scientists started noticing these unusual yellow blobs, kind of like the ones you see right here. And it wasn't just one or two, it was like a lot of them pretty much all over the place. At first they found a few dozen, then they found a few hundred, and eventually it was in the thousands. And so back in 2016, uh, the scientists behind this project decided to kind of change the direction of Milky Way project and focus specifically on identifying these yellow blobs, or yellow balls as they're known now. 
And because a lot of these objects were only appearing in the infrared light and were still invisible in the optical light, basically you would not be able to see this with a typical telescope, and this data was actually coming from the Spitzer telescope using the infrared filter, it wasn't really long until scientists realized that they were actually looking at a completely new type of an object that nobody has ever seen before. And well, eventually, over the years, over the past five years or so, the scientists were able to identify over 6,000 of them in a region of about one-third of the size of the Milky Way. But what exactly are these balls and what exactly is going on here? Well, even early research was pretty clear in establishing that what we're looking at are very likely these early formations that eventually become typical stars. But to be more exact or to try to understand what's really happening here, we need to start with this picture right here. This shows us the so-called main sequence stars. Our sun is right here, this is the G-type star. The most common type of a star is this M-type or red dwarf, and some of the brightest and most energetic stars are usually O-type. The stars on the left will usually long very very long time, up to several trillion years, whereas the stars on the right, such as O-type, will normally have lifespans of maybe a few million years, possibly even less than one million years mostly because they end up eating up through a lot of energy really quick and then go supernova. But prior to becoming a main sequence star, a star will actually undergo through something known as, well, for the lack of better acronyms, PMS, pre-main sequence. And depending on how massive the final star becomes, it will usually have one of two main PMS stages or pre-main sequence stages. So, for example, let's take a look at this image. What this is showing us is what's known as the Herbic AEBE star, and it's essentially a pre-main sequence star for some of the more massive stars out there. Normally, anything that's between 2 and 10 masses of the Sun is going to start its life as this. In a nutshell, these are really, really powerful nebula-like clouds that have a lot of different emissions, with these really, really powerful stars in the middle usually embedded in this gas-like formation that resembles a typical nebula. And so a lot of the more massive stars usually begin their life this way. But for less massive stars, for stars less than two masses of the Sun, they actually begin their lives in much smaller clouds, known as T Tauri stars, that will also have some sort of a cloud-like formation nearby, but generally be a lot less massive and sometimes also possessing some sort of a early planetary disk or some sort of a flat-like formation nearby. You can even see some of these formations in this image right here. And lastly, stars that are more than 10 masses of the Sun normally don't even go through these stages and just directly collapse into a very massive and extremely active object. But the thing is, what happens before these stages? What happens before this PMS stage, pre-main sequence star? And this is something that the scientists haven't really been certain about until they started discovering these unusual yellow balls pretty much all over the galaxy. Because now it's actually pretty clear that before this stage, before these two stages that I just showed you, there's another very obvious stage that pretty much most of the stars, if not all of the stars, go through. That stage being the, I guess, yellow ball stage. It doesn't have a better name just yet, but that's what the scientists are calling it for now. And essentially what we're looking at in this particular picture are these extremely early stars, possibly only a few thousand, maybe hundred thousand years in age way, way before they start forming anything else and still actually accreting a lot of gas into themselves. And as all of this happens, they actually start emitting this yellow glow that's visible in the infrared. Now remember, this is not optical yellow light. This is infrared light that was converted into yellow light for us to see. And so what these yellow blobs of matter represent are almost like cocoons. They're basically like these regions of space where new stars are going to be born. Not just one or two stars, but like a lot of stars, possibly even a hundred. So it's sort of like this birthplace of a lot of different stars. So in a sense, it's like a something that will eventually probably become a star cluster, but at the same time might just become just a bunch of separate stars. And so according to the scientists, pretty much all of the stars, no matter their mass, usually start their life this way. This is basically that one stage that seems to unite all of the stars in the galaxy and probably all of the stars in the universe. But the thing is, not all of them will end up the same, obviously. And according to the recent study, it seems that approximately 20% of these yellow balls will then turn into really massive stars, whereas about 80% of them will actually become a collection of much smaller stars, possibly stars similar to the Sun and similar to some of the nearby smaller stars. And the ones that do become these really gigantic stars, very massive and very powerful O or B-type, 
will also probably end up blasting away so much energy that the entire cloud near them will dissipate really quickly, leaving almost nothing behind. And some of these more massive and more powerful stars, such as the O-type or even the B-type stars, might end up releasing so much energy and so much material that they will probably also leave behind their own bubbles afterwards. Which means that even though a lot of these yellow balls might start the same, they do end up progressing and evolving completely different afterwards. But it's really interesting how all of them do seem to start from the same formation that the scientists refer to as yellow balls. And of course what all of this suggests is that, well, they do seem to possess similar material on the inside. The yellow glow is very likely produced by some sort of an organic molecule that emits exactly the same light when a very powerful energetic object starts to emit certain frequencies in the middle. So basically all of these early stars, all of these yellow balls are producing pretty much the same colors simply because of all of this organic material that's present in this really really large cloud or this really large cocoon of new stars. But the vast majority of all of these yellow balls discovered, or close to about 5000 of them or so, will end up producing intermediate sized stars. So in this case K-type, F-type and G-type stars, similar to our Sun. But because of this discovery, we can now kind of make more sense of how the stars progress through their lives, and even start making more sense of what happens to early stars and how they develop as well. So now we know that even before the previously mentioned t tauri stage, or the more powerful Herbig AEBE stage, all of the stars seem to also undergo the yellow ball stage. And if all stars start as a yellow ball stage, it means that now, or at least in the future, the scientists might be able to look at a certain yellow ball, find out certain properties coming from this region, and then be able to predict what sort of a star or what sort of stars this will end up producing. Which is pretty much the goal of some of the recent studies focusing on these unusual objects. But I guess for now we don't really know much else. It seems that this is definitely one of the earliest stages of star development we've discovered so far. It also seems to be a stage that pretty much all of the stars go through. But the scientists still need to try to understand how these yellow balls differ from one another and what exactly happens for some stars compared to other stars in order for them to become really massive or in order for them to create a lot of smaller stars. This is not something we understand really well just yet. But for me personally, the best part of all of this is of course, once again, that this is coming from the citizen scientists. This is coming from community of people interested in these topics that by accident discovered something unusual, just like back in the days, the scientists discovered the unusual Dimmin star that today is referred to as the Tabby star, or some of the other incredible discoveries that we've talked about on this channel. So if you are interested in these topics, and if you actually want to participate, as always, the link for Zooniverse and all of these other projects is in the description below. But I guess until we discover something else, well, that's pretty much it. There's unfortunately nothing else to mention about these yellow balls until the scientists discover something else. Also, hopefully they'll get a better name for them. Hello wonderful person, this is Anton, and today we're going to be discussing the center of our galaxy, and specifically the black hole right in the middle, known as Sagittarius A star. Because the recent analysis that was just released by NASA and a scientist whose paper you can find in the description suggests that they might have discovered the evidence for some kind of a jet that seems to have emanated from the center of the galaxy from the black hole itself, with the jet itself resembling something like this, something that you see in this picture. But the jet itself doesn't seem to be active right now. As a matter of fact, whatever the scientists discovered, seems to be slowly decreasing in luminosity and seems to be decreasing in power, or basically it's turning off. And that's actually the exciting part of the study. But all this of course relates to some of the previous discoveries, specifically the discoveries from various other telescopes, such as the Fermi telescope that discovered these huge bubble-like formations and gamma rays that were very likely produced by these jets as well, but something like 3 to 4 million years ago. And more recently, the scientists have also identified smaller bubbles coming from the center, but this time only visible in the X-rays or in radio waves, with several other formations identified in a somewhat similar pattern as well. So essentially, it's as if two different jets protruded from the center of the galaxy and emitted a tremendous amount of energy approximately a million years ago. But none of this, of course, should come as a surprise, because we know that that's essentially what black holes do, and we know this by observing other black holes in other galaxies. 
And because somewhere right there in the middle where the stars are orbiting, there is a black hole that's about 4.1 to maybe 4.3 million masses of the sun, and because it does have quite a lot of matter falling into it once in a while, we sort of expect our black hole to become active once in a while as well. And because of this, scientists have been sort of looking for the signs of this activity in the past in order to establish if, for example, it has any effects on planet Earth or if it has any other effects on the formation of stars in the vicinity. Mostly because we know that from other galaxies, when black holes become way, way too active, they do have a tendency to actually extinguish star formation and potentially have other tremendously powerful effects on, for example, various planets. And interestingly enough, this emission right here that was detected by Fermi telescope was ridiculously powerful. It happened about 4 million years ago, and it created these extremely large formations, thousands of light years in length, that are so powerful that they actually emit gamma rays. But on top of this, these formations have also affected some of the nearby gas relatively far away from our galaxy. They actually energize the formation that we sometimes refer to as the Magellanic Stream. It's a formation of gas in various stars that seems to stretch between the Magellanic Cloud galaxies. The video with more detail is somewhere right there, by the way. And interestingly enough, when these tremendously powerful bubbles were formed, their emissions ionized a lot of the gas in the Magellanic Stream at a distance of 200,000 light years away from us. And the activity from the gas is still even visible today. So what this implies is that these were ridiculously powerful events. So powerful that our galaxy probably resembled something like this, at least for a while, with the jets probably emitting this energy for at least a few thousand years. But in this study, the scientists really wanted to sort of zoom in on the center of the galaxy and wanted to investigate some of the signs of the potential previous jets or possibly even discover signs of an actual jet still being there. Because at the moment, no jets are visible from the center of the galaxy, only the signs of previous emissions. And to do this, in their study, they essentially used a multi-wavelength approach. By using the various frequencies, they observed the center of the galaxy and used four different observations from four different telescopes to create a relatively accurate map of the center of the galaxy, showing some of the formations that were previously not actually known to us. And here they actually looked at a lot of different molecules that are present in a lot of this gas and a lot of these clouds. And here we're not just talking about hydrogen, we're also talking about more complex molecules such as methyl alcohols, carbon monosulfides, and a few other things which they then also combined with a supercomputer simulation trying to understand what could have happened in the center here to create these particular formations. And their best explanation right now is essentially summarized right here. A variety of different gas in this region right here, and also right here, was sort of pushed away by some sort of a jet that used to exist in this region, which forms a somewhat narrow linear feature of molecular gas that's nearly 15 light years in length away from the central black hole. And at a slightly farther distance away from this, they've discovered an inflating bubble of hot gas most likely created when this jet illuminated all of this gas. And it seems to be directly aligned with the jet itself at a distance of about 35 light years away from the center, suggesting that the jet was hitting the gas, inflating it in the process. But all of this currently is only showing us the residual effects, the leftovers. It doesn't show us the actual jet. It's essentially just evidence of a jet hitting all of this, but the jet itself is now absent. But by using further simulations in a supercomputer, they were able to establish the approximate shape of this formation. As you can see right here, the jet seems to bend along multiple streams as it moves away from the black hole. And so it sort of creates these unusual tendril-like formations, which then affect all of this hydrogen gas, creating the formation that the scientists were observing. But obviously, it doesn't end here. This then pushes more gas and creates even bigger bubbles. As a matter of fact, the scientists discovered these extending bubbles up to about 500 light years away from the center. And those are actually related to the previous discoveries made approximately a year ago. The video about this should be somewhere right there. And so based on these observations, the scientists concluded that in the last million years or so, it's not really known when, but definitely in the last million years, the black hole most likely increased its brightness by roughly around a million times essentially turning it into an active galactic black hole, or active galactic nucleus as it's usually known. Which also means that it might have resembled something similar to this once again, and it seems to have done this at least twice in the last few millions of years. But we don't have to imagine what the galaxy looked like. 
As a matter of fact, in this study, the scientists identify an actual galaxy somewhere out there that seems to resemble Milky Way when it became somewhat active. It's a galaxy that you see right here in this image. A galaxy that was actually quite extensively studied before and it was discovered to be what's known as a Cipher galaxy. It's known as M77 or Messier 77 and it seems to have almost identical structures right at its center, something similar to the Fermi bubbles, to the bubbles discovered by the X-ray telescopes and the infrared telescopes, but more importantly it seems to also possess a relatively small jet. And so the central structure of this galaxy seems to be a really good opportunity for us to study what might have happened in the Milky Way approximately a million years ago, because it's actually happening there right now. And at a distance of 47 million light years away from us, this is one of the nearest such galaxies to us, and it can definitely show us what the Milky Way was going through back in the days. And so by studying Messier 77 and also learning more about Sagittarius A star, the black hole in the middle of our own galaxy, we can then maybe start identifying some of the effects all of this has on nearby stars, but I guess more importantly, figure out if this has any effect on planet Earth. Do these jets actually cause any effects on our planet? And have these jets affected our atmosphere or possibly even life on our planet in any way before? Considering the power of these jets and considering the fact that they can last for up to about 50,000 years and considering that they can actually sustain themselves for nearly 100,000 years or even longer, it would be extremely important for us to understand how these active galactic nuclei or these active black holes might influence planets like planet Earth, the planets with active atmosphere, active biosphere, and of course life. So this is probably one of the most important findings we can make here. If we find that sometime a million years ago there was a dramatic shift that was possibly caused by activation of the central black hole, well in that case we might want to start worrying about things. But until then we probably shouldn't really worry much. And specifically because in this study, the scientists have officially confirmed that the jet seems to be powering down. And it's probably going to be doing this for thousands of years. It's quite unlikely that anything is going to reactivate it anytime soon. So at least for the time being, we should be totally fine. But in the meanwhile, someone should definitely consider studying Massey 77 in more detail to learn if there are any potential effects. Hello wonderful person, this is Anton, and today we're going to be discussing our own galaxy and the satellites of the Milky Way. But more specifically, we're discussing this new study that sort of suggests our Milky Way doesn't actually have that many satellites to begin with. The galaxies we usually refer to as satellites turn out to be something a little bit different. So let's discuss this idea of satellite galaxies in a little bit more detail and talk about this recent discovery. But first of all, I guess let's start with the map and sort of the idea of what we're talking about. And I guess let's start with this image right here provided by the press release you can find in the description. This here shows us the night skies with some of the well-known dwarf galaxies that have been discovered in the last few decades. Now the famous ones here are of course the Large Magellanic Cloud and the Small Magellanic Cloud. The two neighboring galaxies you see in this simulation with the Large Magellanic Cloud being right here and the small Magellanic Cloud being very close to it. So these are the galaxies we've known about for hundreds and thousands of years, mostly because they're visible even without a telescope. You just have to be in a dark enough place. But this interesting video by Marcel Pawlowski shows us how a lot of new galaxies were discovered in the last few decades, with many of them now visible using powerful telescopes. All of these very, very tiny dwarf galaxies, for the most part, were referred to as the so-called satellite galaxies with 59 of them confirmed to be within approximately 1.4 million light years away from planet Earth. With some of them also being visible in this image right here, the Phoenix Dwarf that you can kind of see on the bottom is considered to be one of the most distant so-called satellite galaxies of the Milky Way. And naturally the Andromeda Galaxy and the Triangulum Galaxy have their own satellites as well. And as the name implies here, the idea behind satellite galaxies is that, well, they're supposed to stay around the main galaxy and to some extent possibly orbit around it. With a lot of these dwarf galaxies slowly being broken apart and sort of stretched because of the tidal interactions and the phenomenon known as the REM pressure coming from the Milky Way itself, eventually sort of being absorbed into the Milky Way and basically leaving almost nothing behind. 
For example, here is an image of a galaxy known as NGC 5907, where the leftovers of an ancient dwarf galaxies are clearly visible as remnants that we usually refer to as a stellar stream. The stream that sort of goes around the galaxy as this ancient dwarf galaxy orbited around it and most likely fell apart, eventually being absorbed completely. And this is naturally something that we've seen around the Milky Way as well. Quite a lot of these stellar streams have been found in the past and we've talked about many of them in some of the previous videos. And one of the most famous and well-studied galaxies, dwarf galaxies, that even today orbits the Milky Way and produces the stellar stream is the galaxy known as Sagittarius Dwarf Galaxy. This beautiful simulation by Eugene Vasiliev, whose paper you can find in the description below, shows us how all of this formed in approximately 2.5 billion years. So this blob you see, that's the Sagittarius Dwarf Galaxy, and the center right there is of course the Sun and the Milky Way. So eventually it produced the stream that sort of resembles something like this. This is exactly what we see in the night skies. But the thing is, of all of the dwarf galaxies we've discovered so far, of all 59 of them in the vicinity of the Milky Way, only Sagittarius Dwarf Galaxy has been officially confirmed to be in orbit. But what about the other ones? Well, it's always been implied that they're also orbiting, but it's never really been officially proven. And looks like this recent study suggests that none of them are in orbit. As a matter of fact, all of them seem to be moving extremely fast, suggesting that pretty much most of them, if not all of them, are basically on their entry to the Milky Way and will very likely get completely destroyed when they come close enough. But first, what exactly happens to smaller objects, specifically smaller galaxies, when they approach a large and massive galaxy such as the Milky Way? So as I mentioned, there are two major effects. There is the tidal stripping, or the tidal effects, and there is also something referred to as the REM pressure stripping. Now, this video here is a perfect illustration for the tidal effects. Essentially, things get really, really stretched out because of the tidal interaction from the massive Milky Way galaxy and the much less massive and a lot less dense Sagittarius Dwarf. It produces the tidal strips you see right here. But what about that RAM pressure? Well, that's something that happens in liquids usually, when some sort of a body moving through the liquid starts to experience a force of drag as it moves through that liquid. And when it comes to galaxies, this is usually experienced when a galaxy is moving really, really fast through some sort of a massive cloud of gas. One of the best examples of this is the galaxy known as NGC 4402, which is actually moving this way, and because of a really large amount of gas that is hitting somewhere right here, a lot of the gas in this galaxy is slowly escaping, creating a kind of a tail behind this galaxy that's sort of visible as this brown stuff you see leaking from the top right. And so normally when a massive galaxy interacts with a smaller galaxy, both RAM pressure and the tidal effects are responsible for first of all stripping the smaller galaxy of everything it has on the inside and also usually stopping the production of stars and then slowly stretching it into tiny tiny strips which eventually get absorbed into the main galaxy. With Sagittarius Dwarf Galaxy now undergoing the last stage, the tidal stripping. But many of these smaller dwarf galaxies, located not too far away from the Milky Way, mostly currently undergoing the REM pressure. And the scientists have discovered that a lot of these closer galaxies have officially stopped producing stars not so long ago. Whereas the ones that are still farther away, such as the Fornax or the Phoenix galaxies, are still producing stars even today. But this new study that, as always, you can find in the description below, conducted a completely new analysis using some of the data from the incredible ESA's Gaia telescope that has been very busy creating extremely accurate maps of the night sky, and specifically studying very precise motion of different stars, different galaxies, and different objects that are usually very difficult to detect. But the main point of the paper being that a lot of these dwarf galaxies are moving way, way too fast to be in orbit of the Milky Way, suggesting that none of these dwarf galaxies are orbiting the Milky Way and are instead falling into it and might orbit in the future. For now though, they are basically on their first approach. Or at least the 40 galaxies that were investigated in this study. And this also means that all of them are relatively new to this region. They most likely arrived less than 2 billion years ago. With each of these 40 dwarf galaxies having way too much energy and way too much velocity compared to, for example, the Sagittarius dwarf galaxy that was previously mentioned. Which means that none of these galaxies spent enough time around the Milky Way to be influenced by it in a lot of ways. And this of course means a lot of things. First of all, the Milky Way didn't really get a chance to influence them just yet. 
As they fall into the Milky Way, there is a high chance that they are going to be disrupted, they are going to be stretched and eventually absorbed by our galaxy. But some of them might actually get captured into the orbit around the Milky Way and might stay here a little bit longer. Which ones? Nobody really knows. On the other hand, because there are not a lot of galaxies orbiting around the Milky Way, it sort of implies that the Milky Way is an extremely voracious eater. It seems to absorb pretty much every dwarf galaxy that gets close to it. It doesn't really leave a lot behind. In other words, all of the previous dwarf galaxies that might have come close to the Milky Way might have just gotten absorbed and completely disappeared from existence, possibly leaving behind nothing but a typical globular cluster. Since there are approximately 150 of these around the Milky Way and possibly a few more undiscovered, it implies that, well, maybe there were approximately 100 different dwarf galaxies that were swallowed in the past. Now obviously I'm just speculating here, but it does seem kind of likely. And this also means that because of the mass of the Milky Way, it's just extremely efficient at destroying these dwarf galaxies and possibly swallowing them completely. And so possibly after one or two orbits, a typical dwarf galaxy completely falls apart and leaves almost nothing behind, just a few stars that eventually get absorbed into the disk itself. Which of course implies that many of these, or most of these, are not technically satellite galaxies. The Milky Way simply leaves nothing behind to become a satellite, or at least for a long enough period. And it also means that there are probably a lot more signs of these ancient dwarf galaxies that were eaten by the Milky Way very likely all over the place, we just can't really see it just yet. Now on the other hand, the scientists also discovered that a lot of these dwarf galaxies have a little bit too much kinetic energy, they're moving with a little bit too much energy, and it's most likely caused by the ramp pressure effects from the amount of different gas and amount of different mass around the Milky Way. And so in other words, just like with NGC 4402 right here, the Milky Way has a very similar effect on all of these dwarf galaxies as they fall into the Milky Way, but it seems to have a lot more effect than originally anticipated. But then on top of this, there was another major discovery in regards to the region where most of these galaxies seem to be located, which one day might reveal their origin and of course the source of a lot of these dwarf galaxies, because they seem to be coming from the same region. Now first of all, this is related to some of the older studies and another simulation by Marcel Pawlowski that suggests that many of these galaxies seem to be in a relatively similar polar region. This is usually referred to as the vast polar structure, also known as VPOS. Now it's maybe not as easy to see it in this simulation, but it sort of becomes more clear if I were to show you the map as it's seen from planet Earth. The vast majority or roughly around 50% of all dwarf galaxies are sort of concentrated in this tiny region of the night skies around the galactic pole, with many of them forming an unusual perpendicular position around the Milky Way galaxy. So basically, if this right here is the disk of the Milky Way, a lot of these dwarf galaxies for some reason are in a somewhat unusual perpendicular location and also seem to be along a very specific region of space. But this new study also identified another structure or another region, which is sort of seen here and also here, that the scientists refer to as Sagittarius Polar Structure, SPOS. And this seems to represent about 20% of all dwarf galaxies, with a lot of them sharing the orbit with Sagittarius Dwarf Galaxy, or at least coming from the same region of space as Sagittarius Dwarf. And all of this is somewhat intriguing, because it kind of implies that many of these dwarf galaxies share the same origin or potentially even share some other properties and were possibly even created from the same gas, but their true origin and of course where they're coming from is currently not really well understood. But one of the implications from the study suggesting that a lot of these dwarf galaxies most likely coming from the same region keep constantly feeding the Milky Way and making our galaxy grow larger and larger, something that's going to be happening for the next few billions of years. But there are obviously quite a lot of unanswered questions, such as for example their origin or how they are created to begin with. And so it looks like the Milky Way galaxy doesn't actually have any satellites except for that one I mentioned previously. Most of the other dwarf galaxies are basically its food, but this of course needs to be confirmed. Hello wonderful person, this is Anton and today we're going to be talking about yet another discovery, a neural discovery of some sort of a repeating radio source, but this time coming directly from the center of the Milky Way galaxy. And once again, nobody really knows what's causing it or really what's happening here to begin with, but at least one previous study might have some hints. 
So let's discuss this in a little bit more detail. And let's start right here. This is one of my most favorite maps of the night skies, known as Glimosco. Because it sort of allows you to imagine the galaxy and the night skies in different frequencies of light. So this is gamma rays, this is X rays, this right here is infrared, but right here we have the radio waves. And by zooming in here you can actually start exploring what certain features of the galaxy look like. Now there are some objects here, like these ones right here, that are really really unusual. And you'll notice there are quite a lot of them all over the place. A lot of these are supernova remnants, but in some cases something else is going on inside or close to them. And some of them have repeating radio signals coming from the vicinity. But these were discovered approximately two decades ago and are currently known as the Galactic Center Radio Transients, also known as GCRT. And so several of these objects have been discovered in the past and at least some of them are believed to be supernova remnant. But in some cases it's still not really certain what exactly form these objects. But this is just to show you that these unusual radio observations with unexplained signals have actually been detected in the past. And some of them still don't really have a very good explanation. But because of the advances in radio telescopes and because of all of the new projects going on, especially in countries like Australia, Chile and also South Africa, a lot of new discoveries have been made in the last few years, with many of these discoveries basically being unexplained radio phenomena. We have phenomena like orcs, odd radio circles, we obviously have phenomena like fast radio bursts, and even these unusual filaments you see right here that I've discussed in one of the previous videos that are still not entirely well understood. But it looks like we now have another one to add to the list, the phenomenon that doesn't really have a good name, but that seems to be some sort of a repeating signal, repeating radio signal. But not really a signal we would refer to as an extraterrestrial intelligence communicating with us. It's more of a natural signal that seems to vary randomly and seems to produce very natural observations coming from some sort of an extremely powerful object. And right now the only name this object has is ASCAP G173608 and these other numbers right here. Basically a pretty long name because there is currently no explanation for what exactly it is. ASCAP of course referring to the 36 different telescopes approximately 12 meters in diameter that represent one of the biggest and most accomplished radio missions currently located in Australia. And so what exactly do we know about this signal so far? Well, first of all, it seems to be more or less coming from the center of the galaxy, very very close to the central black hole. It also seems to be a variable and repeating object, meaning that it doesn't really have an exact pattern, but it has been detected several times from exactly the same region. In this particular case, it seems to have been visible for several weeks at a time and then disappeared for a pretty long time as well. For example, some of the previous observations prior to 2019 did not really detect anything, uh, or at least nothing was visible in the older data. But once ASCAP became operational, for roughly around a year and a half between April 2019 and August 2020, this particular signal appeared 13 different times at random intervals. Yet interestingly, when using a slightly different telescope, specifically the Parkes Observatory that's also located in Australia, the follow-up multi-month observations around the same period did not really observe anything in that particular region. Which actually reminded several people of the story from Parkes Telescope, the story of peritons. These were the unusual signals detected for several years coming from some unusual objects somewhere out there that were only detected by the Parkes Telescope. But in the end, it turned out to be signals coming from someone opening the microwave oven a little bit too soon. This was producing just the right amount of radiation to reflect in the telescope. And so because of this, this could maybe explain some of these observations. But then the follow-ups from South Africa from the Meerkat telescope managed to also detect the signal. And not so long afterwards, another telescope in Australia picked them up as well. So this was definitely not just some microwave or some unusual radio source from planet Earth. Something was definitively happening in the center of the galaxy. Something that was turning off and then turning on, just to disappear again a few months later. But because this object was visible in some telescopes but not other telescopes, and also certain telescopes only saw it once but not other times, this made this even more unusual and more elusive. Something unusual, something really difficult to explain was happening here, but it was definitely happening, and definitively happening really really far away from planet Earth. 
But what made this even more mysterious is that additional observations using other frequencies, including of course observations in the visible light and even X-rays, or actually even infrared observations, also discovered absolutely nothing in this region, so whatever it was, it was only visible in radio light. And to make things even more complicated, the light was also extremely polarized. Or basically twisted. And this twisting is usually, or at least in most cases, the result of some sort of an extremely powerful magnetic field. And so if this particular radio light came through some really magnetically charged particles, or some areas filled with a lot of magnetic fields, or originated from some sort of magnetized object such as a neutron star or even a magnetar, this could potentially explain what we're observing, but it still would not explain why we're not observing anything else. No X-rays, no gamma rays, no visible light, nothing. Only radio waves. So what exactly could it be? And what could have actually created this? Well, in terms of the other signals similar to this, scientists have detected similar radio observations from some really powerful regions in the universe. For example, typical supermassive black holes, certain types of binaries, such as eclipsing binaries where one object usually steals a lot of mass from the other object, or even certain types of extremely powerful flaring stars. Stars that sort of explode for a little bit, release a lot of energy, but then quiet down and go back to their normal stage. But the problem is that normally, these events also release a tremendous amount of X-rays. It should be at least partially visible in some other, more powerful light. At least some light, maybe infrared light. But none of this was visible in anything but radio waves. As a matter of fact, any kind of a star emission or any kind of a major eruption from even a magnetar will usually follow some other observations in at least other frequencies of light. Even the most powerful radio emitters in the universe, the radio galaxies, will still produce light in other uh, types of frequencies. I guess a good example would be right here, in the closest radio galaxy to us, Centaurus A. It's easily visible in radio lights, it's also visible in the microwaves, somewhat invisible in the infrared, sort of detectable in the visible light, and also somewhat apparent in X-rays and gamma rays. And so these types of powerful radio objects are expected to emit something else. Okay, but could it still be some sort of a neutron star, for example? Maybe a pulsar, maybe a magnetar, or some other similar compact star? Well, in most cases, pulsars or neutron stars tend to repeat themselves quite frequently and with a lot of periodicity. And they also tend to do things much, much faster. They change things in hours, maybe even minutes, not really in weeks and months. And also during the observations, there was at least a period of several months when nothing was detected at all. This would be very difficult to explain if this was just a magnetar or some sort of a neutron star. And also all other powerful events such as gamma ray bursts, supernova and so on, cannot really explain anything here. And so really the only thing we seem to know about this object is that it has some similarity to these previously mentioned GCRTs. But some of the GCRTs have been explained as supernova remnants or other similar powerful events that do not always just have radio waves. So whatever this is, is really difficult to explain and is currently one of the few radio objects out there that seems to have no natural explanation at the moment. Obviously not the only one, but one of the very few. And so at the moment it does seem to be a completely new class of an object. An object that's really never been seen before, an object that currently does not have a very good acceptable explanation. It might be related to GCRTs, and it might have a similar explanation to those other objects, but right now nobody really knows what's going on here. By the way, one of the more interesting explanations when it came to GCRT objects, other than explaining them as a supernova, was actually a type of a white dwarf that might emit a tremendous amount of radio waves for one reason or another. These radio pulsing white dwarfs have been proposed in the past, and at least one object known as AR Scorpii has been previously observed to emit certain radio waves that seem to align with this particular explanation and definition. But in this particular case, it's really too early to tell what's going on here. It would take a lot more observations, a lot more analysis, and very likely a lot of follow-ups using different telescopes in order to truly discover what's actually sending those signals to planet Earth that seem to disappear for several months and seem to reappear for several weeks. And although I'm pretty sure it's not aliens, I guess you never know. Anyway, on that note, we'll definitely be talking about this in some of the future videos. For now, all you have to know is that, well, first of all, there have been a lot of different unusual discoveries in regards to radio waves and a lot of new unexplained radio phenomena that even now currently have no good explanation. 
And so in the next few years, I'll be talking a lot about a lot of these potential explanations and a lot of new videos will try to solve some of these mysteries. Hello wonderful person, this is Anton, and today we're going to be discovering something else about our own galaxy, the Milky Way. Another recent paper came out not so long ago suggesting something unusual in one of the galactic arms of our galaxy. One of the arms in the Milky Way seems to have some kind of a break, a spiral arm break. Something that was very recently discovered using the new data from the Gaia telescope. Something that until now was not actually known and something that was not suspected. But it's not unusual and I wanted to explain why, while also explaining some of the other relevant details about this particular paper and about the study. But first of all, it's important to understand that it's actually kind of difficult for us to see what our galaxy looks like, mostly because we're located inside of it, pretty deep inside of it. And one of the main difficulties in trying to understand what the galaxy looks like is actually establishing distances to various objects. For example, we might be able to see certain density of stars in a region somewhere, but we don't really know how far away those stars are from one another. But because of ESA's Gaia telescope, in the last few years more and more data came out and became available to try to figure out a lot of these different structures, mostly because it discovered extremely precise distances to billions of different objects out there. And because of this, we now have quite a lot of data to start figuring out what the actual galaxy looks like and what some of the parts of the galaxy might represent. This is why a lot of different discoveries in regards to the structure of the galaxy, including one of the recent ones that should be popping up somewhere right there at some point, have essentially been made after Gaia mission became operational. And so this recent study used the data from the Gaia telescope, combining it with the infrared data from the Spitzer telescope. The telescope responsible for creating what's known as the Glimpse Survey, also known as the Galactic Legacy Infrared Midplane Survey Extraordinaire. The survey and the telescope perfect for studying the galactic arms. And there's a really important reason for that. If you were to look at a typical galactic arm, a typical galactic arm would contain an overdensity of various star-forming gas clouds and a lot of different young stars producing a lot of infrared radiation. As a matter of fact, most of the infrared radiation would be coming from the galactic arms. And so by using infrared survey, it would be much easier to establish where the galactic arms are located and to study their structure and to study their shape. And to date, the most accurate representation using the data from these telescopes makes the galaxy look something like this. This is from NASA and JPL lab, with our sun located somewhere right here, right between two major galactic arms, but inside a smaller galactic arm. But at the moment, this is still a relatively rough representation. In the last few years, some major discoveries have already suggested that, for example, our galaxy could be wobbling and producing all sorts of wave-like shapes, while also not really being flat, but instead being somewhat warped. We've also recently discovered at least one minor arm on the outskirts of the galaxy, and there are probably a lot of these arms pretty much all over the place. So even though the galaxy seems to possess four major arms, there could be a lot of smaller ones that have still not been found. But in this paper, the scientists decided to focus on one of the major arms that's essentially closest to us, the Sagittarius arm. So essentially this arm that kind of goes right here, and the one that astronomers often refer to as Sagittarius Carina arm, because it's actually technically two arms. It starts as Sagittarius arm, then it sort of disappears and becomes Carina arm. And today it's believed to be one of the most pronounced arms in our galaxy, with a tremendous amount of young stars, giant molecular clouds, and a lot of beautiful and easily visible in infrared regions that allow us to study this arm with a lot of detail. And because generally young stars and a lot of nebular clouds usually align with the location of these galactic arms, by precisely measuring the distances to those nebula, it's thus possible to sort of start mapping the location of various arms in a galaxy. And in this case, Spitzer Telescope combined with Gaia Telescope create a perfect combination to study all of this. And so when they put all of this data together, they did discover something unusual inside the arm itself. So normally when you look at a typical galactic arm, the so-called angle of pitch is about 12 degrees. Mathematically speaking, it refers to the angle that can be visualized this way. So this angle right here in the galactic arm in our galaxy is believed to be approximately 12 degrees. But the analysis of several objects, such as nebular clouds, present in the Sagittarius arm, established another object with an angle of about 60 degrees. A collection of young stars, collection of nebular clouds, forming something that's about 3,000 light years in length. 
something that essentially crosses the arm itself, making it stick out quite dramatically if you were to look at it from the top. With this being the first major structure inside the galactic arm that has such a dramatic different orientation compared to everything else around it. And interestingly enough, a lot of super famous nebula seem to be part of this structure. For example, the very famous Eagle Nebula that's actually famous for this right here that contains the famous Pillars of Creation is apparently inside the structure, with the other famous objects being the Omega Nebula, the Trifid Nebula, and lastly, the Lagoon Nebula that you see right here, with all four nebula being part of this unusual formation. But I guess the question is, is this something completely unexplainable or is this something that was actually expected? And the answer seems to be the latter. This seems to be what the scientists often refer to as the feathers or the spurs of a galactic arm. And many such spurs have been discovered in other galaxies. The majority of spiral galaxies that have galactic arms usually have them straight like you see right here. But approximately 30% of all galaxies discovered tend to have somewhat unequal and somewhat feathery looking spirals. These are known as the flocculent spirals. And so approximately 30% of all galaxies out there that have spiral arms have flocculent spiral arms. They have these unusual feather-like formations. The word flocculent in this case just means fluffy. So essentially they have spiral arms that are somewhat discontinuous and somewhat broken up in places. With the galaxy known as NGC 2841 being the most commonly used example. And because so many of them seem to have these unusual formations, for many many decades now the scientists were kind of wondering well, is our galaxy part of the majority that has relatively straight arms, or is our galaxy also somewhat flocculent? Does it have these fluffy feather-like formations? And it looks like, according to the study right here, the answer is that it does seem to have these flocculent formations. The arms are not entirely straight, they seem to have breaks, and they seem to have these feathers. With the first feather discovered so far being this unusual formation that currently is referred to as the far 3 kiloparsec arm. And so, in reality, our galaxy might actually resemble something like this, more so than something like this, at least to some extent. It does seem to contain these feathers, and they do seem to break some of the arms. Or, okay, the reality is that there's at least one of these feathers, but chances are that there are a lot more of them out there. And overall, it seems to be a pretty interesting structure. It contains approximately 25 different star-forming regions, or star-forming nebula, but also seems to be spinning with the rest of the galaxy at exactly the same speed as everything around it. So it's definitely part of the galaxy and it's definitely not something unusual created by some unusual collision. And if your next question is, but how was it created? The answer to that is that, well, at the moment, nobody really understands how these structures are made. Okay, so there are at least some models, such as this one right here, the model known as the Stochastic Self-Propagating Star Formation, that kind of tries to explain the formation of these structures, but the more realistic answer in this case is that it's still being debated and it's still not entirely well understood. And so to answer how this is created, I guess we're gonna have to wait a few years until someone figures this out and until someone proves this definitively. And by the way, there's at least one more paper I'm going to post in the description that goes on a very detailed investigation and analysis of a lot of different feathers located in a lot of different galaxies, with some of these galaxies containing dozens and even hundreds of these feather-like formations. So definitely something that exists in a lot of other galaxies out there. Hello wonderful person, this is Anton, and today we're going to be talking about a discovery coming out of a very strange cluster that orbits our own galaxy. A star cluster known as Palomar 5, with orbit visible in this picture right here. And what makes this cluster extremely unusual compared to everything else we've discovered is that it seems to possess a tremendous amount of black holes on the inside, at least a hundred and possibly a lot more. And so let's talk a little bit more about this unusual discovery and what exactly this means and discuss these clusters in general. First of all, our galaxy has roughly around 150 different global clusters around it. Without exception, all of these clusters are extremely old, usually at least 10 billion years old, meaning that many of them were produced when the galaxy was just being created. And generally speaking, we can usually use these globular clusters to measure the age of different galaxies as well, while at the same time also discovering some of the details of various galactic collisions that happened to Milky Way and to some of the nearby galaxies as well. But generally speaking, star clusters and globular clusters sort of look like this. But some of them, over time, because of the gravitational interactions with the Milky Way, or possibly 
interactions with the mysterious dark matter that's located all over the halo of the galaxy. Some of these clusters over time start to kind of stretch and experience tidal disruption. With this illustration right here roughly showing us how all of this happens. So after about a billion years, a typical global cluster will generally start to acquire two different tidal tails on both sides. And as it orbits around the galaxy, the tails eventually stretch, forming very beautiful formations, which within only about 5 billion years creates something that looks like this. And in the past decade or so, we've discovered quite a lot of these formations because of the advancements in various telescope technologies. And today we refer to these formations as stellar streams. This one right here was discovered back in 2007. But some of these streams are also formed by different galaxies, specifically dwarf galaxies. And this is kind of what the scientists believed Palomar 5 to be at first as well. Over time they realized that it was just too small and not massive enough. And with further measurements they realized that this was basically a globular cluster you see right here that's being tidally stripped apart by the powerful gravitational forces from the Milky Way galaxy. But there are a lot of features that make Palomar 5 kind of unique and different from other clusters. First of all, it's about 10 times less massive than other clusters. And it's at least 5 times longer than a typical global cluster we're familiar with. Making this a cluster that's about to become a stellar stream. It's not one yet, but it's definitely going to be one. And a lot of new observations coming from this cluster do suggest that what you're looking at right here, these are stars escaping the cluster itself. With the stream itself already being about 5,000 masses of the sun and approximately 30,000 light years long. Which is slightly longer than the distance of the center of the galaxy to planet Earth that you see right there. Now the cluster itself is right here about 60,000 light years away from the galactic center. But since it only recently started to become flattened and stretched by the gravitational forces, it implies that either A, it was captured relatively recently by the Milky Way, or B, it was in a very different orbit around the Milky Way galaxy. So in other words, something might have actually changed its orbit, causing it now to fall through the Milky Way galaxy and thus becoming tidally disrupted. But unlike other clusters and unlike other tidal streams, what makes Palomar 5 extremely unusual is an extremely high number of black holes located on the inside. About 20% of the entire mass of the cluster is basically black holes. With most black holes being about 20 masses of the sun or more, and at least 100 of them present somewhere in the center of the cluster itself. And since it's believed that all of them were produced by exploding very massive stars billions and billions of years ago, it's not entirely clear why this particular cluster seems to have way more black holes than any other cluster we've found so far, with potentially one explanation being that maybe there were just a lot of really massive stars to begin with. Maybe initially this cluster just had a lot of different stars that turn into all of these black holes, with an average mass of a star just being higher than in other clusters. But there are a few more things that make Palomar 5 really unusual. Now first of all, this is so far the only cluster directly associated with a stellar stream. Other stellar streams already sort of exist, but we don't really know which cluster might have actually formed them. And so because of this, Palomar 5 might explain a lot of things about stellar stream formation, while also helping us understand what happens to global clusters when they're tidally disrupted by various galaxies. The other unusual discovery about the cluster is of course in regards to its future, which sort of relates to the explanation of how this is possible. So first of all, a lot of this was based on trying to simulate various orbits while changing various parameters in the cluster until the scientists found a good match between the observations and between the theoretical predictions. And the simulations here suggest that the cluster very likely started like this. But over time, because stars were more likely to escape the cluster than the black holes, the number of black holes started to increase, yet the number of stars started to decrease. While at the same time, because there were more and more black holes in the center of the cluster, the gravitational interactions between stars and these black holes forced a lot of these stars to move to the outer parts of the cluster or to eventually escape completely. And as more and more stars started to escape from the center and to develop this stream that we see right here, the only things that were sort of staying on the inside were hundreds and hundreds of different types of black holes. And as more black holes appeared, more stars would disappear with time, eventually turning this place into a collection of black holes and no stars whatsoever. 
But because of this unusual discovery, the scientists also imply that many such dissolved clusters probably already exist around the Milky Way galaxy. But unlike a typical globular cluster, these would be dominated by just black holes and maybe some neutron stars, but mostly black holes. They would also be almost impossible to detect with the only potential sign of their existence being some leftovers of ancient stellar streams that might be discovered in some of the future studies. But this also might help the scientists answer the questions about other stellar streams that are orbiting the galaxy right now. The origin of some of them is not really well known yet. More importantly, this also helps us understand or helps us realize that a lot of different black hole collisions, especially the ones we've been detecting in the last few years, might also be coming from these global clusters that would be otherwise invisible to most telescopes. So the large population of black holes in this case does actually imply that there's a high chance of collision between them at some point in the future. But since we can't really see black holes and since we can't really discover them in any other way, it's almost impossible for us to figure out how many such clusters exist already and also how many black holes are there to begin with. Now the simulation here implies that it's maybe over 100, but that's just a simulation. In reality, we don't actually know. Nobody has any idea on how to measure the amount of black holes in these clusters. But in this study, the scientists do use a mathematical analysis and sort of find a way to maybe estimate the number of black holes by just looking at how many stars are being ejected from the cluster compared to the ones that stay in. And so in that sense, it is a pretty interesting analysis and a pretty interesting study. But unfortunately, there's not much else we know about either the cluster or the black holes in this cluster. Once we find something else unusual about it or some other unusual cluster out there, I'll make sure to follow this up with another video. Until then, thank you for watching, subscribe if you still haven't, share this with someone who loves learning about space and sciences, and maybe come back tomorrow to learn something else. Maybe support this channel on Patreon by joining the channel membership or by buying the wonderful person t-shirt you can find in the description. Either way, stay wonderful, I'll see you tomorrow, and as always, bye-bye.